This is my channel's monthly compendium for the month of September 2023. Enjoy. Case file number 1263, written by two aspirin later, Peter Weller's Roman Rescue. In 1991, I was in Rome traveling alone and walking around the city. Three guys were following me through the streets and piazzas. I looked very American, I suppose, and they were hurling small objects at my back and they would stop walking when I turned around to look. Then they would pick up the pace when I started to pick up my pace. They were getting closer yet still around 15 feet away. I walked towards a fountain in a piazza where there is a large crowd and stand near people facing a restaurant hoping for some safety. The three guys are talking to each other and slowly work themselves into the crowd. Then a tall man with a larger than life voice and handsome features exits a doorway of the restaurant and points to me and says, let's get him in here for the scene. Freaking Peter Weller walks towards me and points at me and says I'm talking to you son, now come on. I enter the restaurant with Peter Weller. He sits me down across from a young lady and this Italian young lady and I pretend to drink coffee for almost an hour while they shoot a few scenes. Peter was surprised I was American and told them that I got lost and needed to get back to my hotel. He arranged for that for me and never saw those guys following me again. Case Notes for File 1264, written by Anonymous. A Soldier's Miracle in the Mists of Chaos. I have the scars and medals to prove this experience. In 2006, I was in a convoy that was hit by an explosively formed projectile, EFP. What's an EFP, you ask? Well, it's like an IED snorted a line of Red Bull and injected pre-workout directly into its scrotum. Or an IED placed into a makeshift cannon with a copper plate over the opening. This copper plate melts as soon as the IED explodes, creating a molten sphere of murder death that can rip through truck armor like a hot knife through cold butter. Anyway, I was in the front truck when we were hit. I was in the turret of our Humvee and the resulting explosion sent me flying. According to the guys in the truck behind me, I ended up some 20 feet in the air before landing hard on the pavement. I was quickly tended to, but at the time I didn't know where my driver and team leader was, no one would tell me. Additionally, we had an American civilian with us and he got messed up just as bad as me. My injuries were mostly in my legs from all the shrapnel that I'm still pulling out 15 years later, as well as some shrapnel in my left hand and half of my face being scratched to hell. The civilian's face and hands were peppered with shrapnel, with one hand having a massive hole in it, as well as having one of his elbows shattered. We ended up in the hospital in the green zone for a while. The civilian ended up getting flown to Germany because of how badly injured he was. Last I heard, he had to have several of his fingers briefly amputated so they could fix further damage in his hand. I ended up back in my unit after three days in the hospital with my leadership ripping the hospital a new one since I still had large holes in my leg. For a month, I walked my happy butt to the medic station to get my wounds treated, which is hilariously how I ended up watching the movie Crank in Russian with my bunkmate Yuri. Around this time, my leg became pretty badly infected. One of the medics even mentioned it looked like gangrene. So, I ended up back at the famous Fort Hood. The doctor I ended up with wanted to amputate on the spot, but me being a stubborn 20 year old, I didn't want to give up since I was super athletic at the time. The doctor, probably thinking I was low key pathetic, sent me home with my leg intact. I was back home for 30 days, had my own medical supplies, and I regularly changed my own bandages. I can tell you right now, removing stuffing from large gashes on your leg is extremely painful as the dried blood glues the bandages and your stuffing together. It's kind of similar to ripping duct tape off your body hair or waxing your private areas. But after 30 days, any trace of infection had completely vanished and my leg healed up on its own. I returned to the doctor and he said in his 20 years, he'd never seen anything quite like what I accomplished. I went on to serve another eight years then depression took its toll, and I've been out ever since. The scars are still on my leg, along with the paperwork left over from the awards I received. They're a constant reminder of this regenerative horror. Creepy File Number 113, written by Smooby. The Christmas Spirits. My mom and I were home alone on Christmas night. 
I was staying up to read a book I had received earlier in the day, and she was on her phone. We were both in the living room. It was after midnight, so this was now technically December 26. My mom announced that she was going to head to bed, and we said goodnight. As she went into her bedroom, we both heard the doorbell ring. Keep in mind, this was at 1.14 in the morning on Boxing Day. She opened her bedroom door in a panic. I tensed up, completely paralyzed. She called out my name, asking if I heard the door. I just remember saying, Come down, please, to her repeatedly. She came rushing down and opened up the door right away, but there was nobody there. It had freshly snowed too, and there were no footsteps anywhere leading to our house. A bit of backstory. My grandmother, on my mom's side, passed away that July, and this was the first Christmas we had without her. In a bizarre coincidence, my grandmother passed at 1.14 p.m., and the doorbell rang at 1.14 a.m. My mom and I still talk about it. We like to say that it was Granny wishing us a Merry Christmas. It's not usual for us to stay up that late, but neither of us were tired for whatever reason. Case file number 1265, written by Wild Goose 424 Lost keys reappear 18 months later in an unbelievable place. Back in 2015, I lost my car keys in the snow at my mother's house. I had to have my fiancé come bring me the spare keys just so I could drive home. They were gone forever. At best, I hope maybe they turn up when the snow melted in the spring. Fast forward 18 months. My sister got a promotion at work. She got a new desk that they hauled out of a storage room to her office on the ninth floor. She sits down to get settled in, opens the desk drawer, and inside, just sitting there like they belonged, were my lost car keys, 50 miles away from where I lost them. We were both in total disbelief. She called me in the middle of the day from work because she was utterly shocked by it. It was freaky as hell and to this day all we can do is laugh because how do you explain that? It freaked me out enough that I wouldn't take the keys back after she found them. They're hanging in our entryway now, years later, an homage to the weird, weird universe. Creepy File Number 114, written by OK Investigator 4590. The Chilling Conspiracy in My Military School. In January 2020, before the pandemic hit, I signed up and went off to military school. I don't know how others operate, but I'm sure this one was like any other, nothing real special or different about it. Now I know it's a joke, or maybe not so much as a joke, but a rumor that these types of places will brainwash you into becoming an obedient lapdog. I'd say it's true if you consider the few times recruiters talk to you and propaganda posters as brainwashing, but this incident made me feel like there was something more behind the scenes. This was only our third week, and we're attending what is essentially our extracurricular class like usual. Normally, it being military school, we follow strict conduct, but whenever we were alone with our instructor, it'd be like any other American classroom. They always said the sergeants and instructors don't work with each other, so we cut loose. Though, I feel that's an obvious lie to get the cadets to act out or say something. As we're informally talking in class, the instructor talks about the projects we will be doing. We were in what essentially was a Firefighter 101 class. I just remembered him discussing with other students that he seemed energized. Just as everyone seemed to be talking or laughing at the same time, he said, Alright guys, time to check out this video. He clicked it on and it began playing from the projector. It started off as what I could only describe as an alternate version of the Warner Bros logo the one with the buildings that form into the WB badge thing. Except it was off, it seemed distorted, the coloring was gritty and old. It felt wrong too, like you were watching some hidden tape not meant to be seen by anyone. And for some reason, your eyes were just glued to it, as if your vision was buffering all your life and you finally found a slot to put it in, like you just snapped on and couldn't get it off. It got deathly quiet, which is the only reason I ended up breaking my gaze. I sat at the very back of the class and could see everyone. And they just sat staring blankly at the screen, like brain-dead vegetables. It really felt like something out of a horror movie. And as I combed the classroom, I soon locked eyes with our instructor, who was already looking at me. He whispered, Shh, they're sleeping.
Bonus file written by Sir Coatsalot. Gamers vs Shadow. I used to live in a very creepy house. Soda cans would fall off tables randomly and then roll away, or I'd hear footsteps in the hallway. One time, my best friend and I were up super late playing video games, and you know when you see something move in the corner of your eye, like a shadow or something, and when you look directly at it, it's usually nothing? Well, that happened. I saw movement. It was like hiding behind the couch right next to us. I didn't look at first. I thought it was nothing. But then my friend kind of glanced over. I asked him, Did you see that too? Him. Bro, what the hell? After that, we both stood there and there was nothing behind the couch. But by far, the creepiest thing that ever happened to me was when I decided not to go on a day-long road trip with my family. I was home alone for a good number of hours and I took a small nap. Like maybe an hour or two. After that, I woke up and played Skyrim and forgot all about that day. But about two weeks later, I'm going through my phone's gallery and there was a picture of me sleeping on that day when I was completely, utterly alone. When I first saw the picture, it didn't click in. I just didn't understand why there was a picture of my back. The photo was taken as if they were standing in the middle of my room. I was facing away towards the wall. All you could really see was the white shirt I had on and the back of my head. Something was off about it. I still remember the chills when it finally clicked that I was home alone that day. I locked the doors before I went to my room. Even remembering it now gives me chills. There was more crap that happened too. One time, while my family was having a small get-together, my nephew, who was around two or three, old enough to be walking and talking, wandered into my room by himself. He started screaming incoherently at first. We thought he had fallen or something. My mom got to him first. He was crying too hard to talk, but as he calmed, he started saying, The bad man is going to get me. The bad man is going to get me. I didn't sleep in that room anymore. It took two months, but we moved after that. Slept in the living room with the night lights on everywhere. I was 16 and afraid of the dark. Hell, some nights I slept in my parents' room on the ground because I was so scared of that house. Later I found out that someone had died there. He was a very angry man, apparently. Either way, I was never happier getting the hell out of there. Case fall number 1266, written by Good Lurks. My 600 mile per hour road trip. I have a weird driving time story from Central California. This was about 2005. I was about 275 miles from LA, driving from San Francisco, and all of a sudden, I drove into this incredibly dense fog bank. I dropped my speed from 80 miles per hour down to 25 miles per hour because the fog is incredibly thick and feels like it's sticking to the car. I get a little peeved because the drive is going to take so much longer, but drive for a few minutes and glance out on my clock and it reads 1241. I drive for what feels like 15 minutes and glance back down at my clock and it still reads 1241. Now I'm more pissed at the fog because I think that the moisture and humidity from the fog have shorted out my dash clock. I keep driving at 25 miles per hour for what feels like an hour, but notice that my gas needle isn't dropping. But I absolutely should have had to stop for gas by now. I keep driving in this fog and looking at my gas needle that doesn't seem to move, and I even thumb it up a few times to check if it's stuck. I know time is passing because I'm listening to music and I've listened to two entire CDs, so I'm guessing I've spent about two hours in this fog. Finally, with a weird lurch, I come out of the fog and my gas needle immediately hits empty. Luckily, I see a gas station sign for the next exit and pull off to get gas and use the bathroom. I walk into the gas station and the clock reads 1257. I ask the attendant if the clock is right and he says it is. I realize that I'm just outside of Bakersfield and somehow I have driven 150 miles in a little over 15 minutes. Oh, and my dash clock is fixed and reading the correct time again. So if the universe hit rewind on you driving, I got the pause button. Bonus file written by Way to Lose It, The Christmas Guardian. I had planned to jump from a great height near where I live. I was just out of energy and love. I had no more life to give, if that makes any sense. It was right before Christmas, and it was snowing. 
I stopped at a hotel near the bridge to mooch off the Wi-Fi to finish my notes. I was just about done when my battery died. Fine. I checked into a room to charge my laptop. As I was waiting, I began to get hungry. I felt burdened by hunger, more annoyed than anything, so I decided to go get something to eat. This hotel was located in a small town, and the only restaurant was right next door. I was over, and there was a closed sign on the door, but the lights were on, and I could hear people inside, so I went in. A grey-haired man came out of the back and told me that he and his employees were having a Christmas party, but their chef could whip something up. I go into the main dining room and wait around a while before getting up to grab myself a beer. This big black guy comes out from the kitchen and asks me what I want to eat. I tell him that a burger and fries would do, or whatever is easiest for him. I go sit down in a booth and ponder what a big black guy is doing out in the middle of nowhere, because the area we are in is pretty close-minded. Anyhow, he comes out from the kitchen with a burger, fries, another beer, and one for himself. He promptly sits down and joins me. My thoughts for my note are promptly pushed away as I become annoyed by his presence. He begins talking to me, telling me about his life, just filling silence, you know? Then he tells me what I'm about to do is a big mistake. If I don't care about living, why not do exactly what made me happy? Why not do all the things I'd been meaning to do but put off for work for solving other people's problems? He said a lot of other things too, some of which felt like he knew me and felt a bit foreboding, but in a good way, like somehow he knew that I would overcome all the suffering and lead a good life. By the end of the conversation, I was too exhausted to finish my note. I decided to finish it in the morning. When I woke up, I decided to give myself one year, just one year to try everything that man suggested. I decided to really, truly do everything I could to be happy, to really give my all to doing the things that I had been putting off. I decided to walk next door and see if I could find him or at least leave him a note. When I walked in, no one knew what I was talking about. There was no Christmas party. No black guy had ever worked there and they closed at 5pm the evening before due to the weather. I walked away stunned, but I couldn't really say surprised. The whole evening seemed surreal. To this day, I have no idea who that man was. I only know that I owe him my life. The changes that I made that year after I met him eventually led to me meeting my husband and having my son. We stopped there on a summer road trip this past year, and I cried when I realized how close I was to the edge. I can't imagine not knowing my husband or my son. I think of that man often, and I call him my angel. Frankly, I don't care if he is or not, but he will always be the angel that saved my life. I hope someday I can pass it on. Case file number 1267, written by Dangerous Radish, 8719. Navigating time bends on the I-5. Driving back north on the I-5, around 2007-ish, I lost many miles. Or maybe time skipped. I don't know. I passed a road sign for a town, X miles away, it was maybe 2.30 am. The miles were substantial, 39, 59, etc. Not two minutes later, I passed through the town. I did not fall asleep, I did not zone out. There was not enough time for me when I passed the marker sign. It still gives me chills. Also, I won't drive parts of I-5 at night anymore. Even before this, I'd get the worst feeling sometimes in more rural parts. I'd get that chills, nausea, terror feeling you get reading stories like this, but ten times worse. I never understood it, but when I lost distance like that, I had that same feeling. Like things were just wrong. I've had shady and sketchy driving interactions. I once had an all-black car with no lights zoom past me at perhaps 170 miles per hour. Runner, I'd guess. But I never felt the way I did about those interactions. This one is different. Case fall number 1268, written by Ed Suom. One act of kindness can ripple through time. I was driving down the freeway in a big city after work, and my car stalled in the left lane. Some guy immediately came up and offered to tow me to the next off-ramp with a tow strap. 
He dropped me off and I tried giving him some money. He declined, telling me to instead do something nice for someone else. A week later, there was a rare downpour as I got in my car. Same one, fixed, after work. Two scruffy looking guys came up running to me and one said, Hey brother, we missed our bus. He wanted to know if I could give the two of them a ride. This was not the best part of town and I wouldn't have been inclined to let them in. But I remembered what that good Samaritan had told me. Pay it forward. Okay, I said, hop in. We drove onto the freeway and I made all my usual turns heading home. It was the same way my two passengers wanted to go. After a while, we got to an exit where they asked to be let off. It was the same exact spot in a city of millions of people where that other guy had unhitched my car from his truck and told me to do something nice for someone else. Creepy file number 115, written by the goddess Hylia, the bone chilling bathroom scream. I was about seven or eight, and I was at a housewarming party at my aunt's and uncle's new house. It wasn't extravagant, it was a lower to middle class mobile home in South Carolina. It wasn't really a big party, just a family, some barbecue out back, red solo cups, all boxes in the garage, and not even distributed to their proper rooms. The only things that were unpacked, and where they should be, was the furniture. So anyway, two of my cousins were there and one of them had a friend over and we were all playing together. Some made up fantasy game where we were pretending to be princesses or something. All of the adults were out back drinking, and I emphasize, there were only four people inside the house. Me, my two cousins, and the friend. The house was set up in such a way that the kitchen was the first room you walked into from the front door. Then there was a living room, then past that was the hallway with the bathroom and bedrooms. I was in the living room on the couch because that was the princess's bedroom, and I was kinda just sitting there idle while the others got snacks. With no warnings or no other sounds, every single one of us hears a female voice let out an ear-piercing, gut-wrenching, overall horrifying scream in the bathroom. It was clear as day, and it was so loud and sudden that it made me jump as the living room was right next to the hallway. My cousins and their friend run out from the kitchen and look at me sitting there, and then we all run from the living room into the bathroom. Not a single person is in there, and nothing is displaced because there wasn't anything unpacked anyway except the toilet paper. We turn back around to see about three adults coming in from the back door, because they had heard it too, coming from inside, so it wasn't any of them. What gets me about this is this. We have all since entertained the idea that it was a prank no one has fessed up to yet. In order for it to have been a corporeal being, they would have had to somehow get into the bathroom without me seeing them from the couch, screamed, ran out of the bathroom to either the back door without any of the four kids in the living room seeing, or out of a window in one of the bedrooms. All of the bedroom windows were locked from the inside. So if they escaped that way, someone would have had to lock it and go out the back door, which again, we would have seen. One of the creepiest things that's happened to me, and before you cry, speaker hidden somewhere, that was one of the first things my uncle checked for when he ran inside and was told by us that none of us had done it. Me and my cousins think it's either something supernatural or something that the adults did. And all of the adults that were there think that one of us screamed and lied about it because we were all in the bathroom when they came in. Either way, the mood at the party was killed really fast after that. Everyone was confused and a little on edge and there wasn't any of that self-satisfied undertone that someone who just played a really good practical joke would have been showing. It was a pretty blood-curdling sound. I'm not sure a human could even make it. Case file number 1269, written by Heather Lore 76 The Mysterious Woman of Destiny. Maybe around age 14, early 90s, we were traveling from Texas up to Tacoma, Washington. We were about out of money, almost out of gas, no food, stuck in Chico, California. I sat in the car while mom took my younger sisters to the restroom at a gas station. I was riddled with anxiety about our situation and looking down. The car door opened and I looked up. A lady that looked like a brown haired Brady mom sat in the seat and faced me. She said, It seems like you're down on your luck. Take this and give it to your mom. Tell her to pay it forward someday to someone who needs it. I looked down into my hand and there was a $100 bill. 
I looked up and she had disappeared. Nowhere in the parking lot, just vanished. I cried. When mom came back, I told her what had happened and she cried. We got gas. There was a guy selling oranges on the side of the road and we bought a bag and went to a local park that had a part of the river with a little spillway dam and went swimming and ate oranges for a couple of hours before getting back on the road. I never saw that lady again, but she saved us, and we did make it up to Tacoma to start our new life. Thank you, stranger lady, with invisible powers. We never forgot your kindness. Case file number 1270, written by Throwaway2021 ABC. How a chance meeting pulled me back from the edge. A few years ago, I was at my lowest point in life. Several people close to me had passed away unexpectedly. I was being bullied every day at my job. My life was falling apart. I was past being depressed. I just couldn't imagine waking up another day. So I'd planned the end of my journey, bought a one-way plane ticket, got sleeping pills, and wrote a series of notes for loved ones to read after. On the day I was to fly out to fulfill my plan, there was a terrible accident on the freeway to the airport. It was shut down both ways. So, I drove into a nearby pub to have a beer and wait out the traffic. The second I sat on the patio with my drink, a gentleman asked if he could sit with me. Whatever I thought, sure, who cares. He told me that whatever I was doing next was a terrible idea and I would regret it. I thought, who is this random tosser? But I listened. He said that he sensed I was in pain, but that I had an incredible life ahead of me, and that this was not the way my story was supposed to end. Again, I'd never met this guy in my life, and hadn't mentioned a word to him about my plan. He asked me to hand him my keys and my wallet, and he'd give them back to me after I talked, and he listened. I poured my heart out to this random guy. I told him all my traumas and pains in life and why I was heading to the airport on a one-way ticket to end my journey in a cemetery across the country where my family was buried. He just listened. And then he pulled out a lighter, asked me to pull out my letters and help me burn them. He told me I was worth so much to the world and that after I finished my drink, I needed to head home and get some sleep. He told me I was going to be okay tomorrow. And I believed him. He then gave me my keys and wallet back. I left that afternoon and went home, hugged my family, got some sleep, and the next day I started working on myself, finding a therapist, a new job. Years later, I'm in a fantastic place in life, so far from where I was that day. To this day, no one in my life knows how close I came to the final step. But this random stranger just somehow understood me and saved my life. I never saw him again. I don't even know his name. It's the most unexplained thing that has ever happened to me. And I think about that guy every day. So thank you, kind stranger, for saving my life that random September day on a pub patio. Bonus file written by Far Bunny. Somehow I knew exactly where my dog was trapped. We had a rescue dog years back, a terrier mix. We lived in the countryside on a wooded hillside and owned about five acres of woodland and rough fields, mostly wild. This dog loved to be up there chasing rabbits, but loved her home too, so would never be gone for very long. One day, she went missing. We took our other dogs up there and searched thoroughly, but nothing. We had another friend bring his dogs, nothing. We advertised, put up posters. We did little but search high and low for six days, but found nothing. On the sixth day, we had pretty much given up hope, but I decided to go up one last time because I had a hunch, a tickle in my belly, about one particular area which had already been thoroughly searched. I took a sickle and a pair of gardening gloves and hacked my way towards the center of a huge bramble patch. It was summer and all I could hear was birdsong and insects, but suddenly I heard a muffled yip. I called her name and then heard her again, getting excited. She was deep underground in a rabbit warren. I stayed, calling to her, until help arrived. The local fire brigade were kind enough to come and help, and we got her out eventually. She ran around like a demented muddy pup, and amazingly, the vet said she was basically okay, and had probably been getting enough moisture from eating mud to keep her alive. I am not generally a fanciful person, but I just knew in my knower she was there. 
no explanation for it. Case file number 1271, written by Forrest Hopkins. Uh, the Coconut of Time. I'd like to preface this by saying that neither my husband nor I do any sort of drugs, suffer from any mental illness, or abuse alcohol. We drank occasionally, but had not been drinking that night. It happened about eight months ago. We lived in a small apartment with our two young children and our dog, while we saved up for a down payment on a home. It was a typical Monday night around 7pm. We had just cleaned up after dinner, my husband was surfing the web, and I was relaxing on the couch. I was reading the back of a cake mix, trying to decide if I had time to bake it, let it cool, frost it, and eat it, before I needed to be in bed. My husband was watching a video on the internet. He said something funny about it, we both laughed. Then, bam, I woke up, face down in bed. My clock read 8am exactly. My alarm hadn't been turned on. I was very confused and could smell the strong scent of coconut. I sat up and looked at my husband, who was also just waking up. He looked at me with a really confused look, and we both jumped out of bed and ran to our kids' room. They were in bed asleep. We went into the living room, and the second our dog saw us, she started whimpering and sort of army crawling towards us. It was such unusual behavior for her. I had never seen her act that way before, and have never since. Nothing looked out of order in our apartment aside from one small detail. The cake mix I had been looking at that night was gone. I searched everywhere for that cake mix and never found it. Another odd detail from that day is that we all were dressed in our pajamas when we woke up except my youngest. He was in the jeans and t-shirt he had been wearing the night before. Neither my husband nor I would have ever put him to bed like that. Neither of us have any memory of getting into our pajamas or anything else after laughing at the comment he made about the video. We, already late for work, both called in sick that day. We spent the day talking about it and trying to make sense of it. At some point that day, he asked me if I had smelled coconut when I woke up. We never found the source of the smell. To this day, I can't look at a cake mix or smell coconut without feeling a little anxious and sick. Bonus file written by SM1020, The Mystery of the Wet-Haired Apparition In college, I was roommates with my childhood best friend for about two years. We are very trusting with each other. We would go into each other's rooms freely and grab whatever we needed. To borrow clothes, hairbrushes, perfume, etc. No questions asked, just a knock if we were in the room to let each other know we were going in. Our rooms are across the hall from each other with the hall facing the kitchen. So from the kitchen, you could see down the hall where our rooms were. At the time, my friend had very long black hair and she's very fair skinned. One day, I get home from work, with my headphones in my ear, talking to my mom about my day. I go into the kitchen and grab a snack. I see her walk out of my room and go into mine, leave my room and go back into hers. She looked like she just got out of the shower, her hair was soaking wet and she was wrapped in a white towel. Her long black hair is what I distinctly remember. Also, she made no eye contact with me, but I didn't think it was weird. I didn't say anything to her since borrowing each other's stuff was normal. I'm still on the phone with my mom so I don't think much of it. I grab my snack, hang up on my mom, and go into my room to watch TV. I figured she's getting ready to go somewhere and we'll talk later. About an hour passes and I go into the kitchen to clean up the plate I ate on. I see her in the kitchen making something to eat and I tell her, Hey, what did you grab from my room earlier? Did you find what you needed? She looks at me like I was crazy and says, What are you talking about? So I say, Yeah, earlier when I got home, I saw you go into my room and grab something. Did you get what you needed? Sorry I didn't say hi, I was on the phone with my mom. She asked me if I'm sure I saw her. I said yes, 100%. She tells me to grab my phone and go to her car ASAP, that she needs to show me something. I had my phone on me, and she grabbed my keys from the kitchen counter along with her purse and she dragged me out of the front door and into her car. She then tells me she got home maybe 5 minutes before we started talking. She had spent the night with her boyfriends and hadn't been home all day. So she has no idea who I saw. I'll never forget the look on her face when she told me this, complete fear and panic. 
She called the cops and they came along with the apartment manager. They checked the whole apartment and found no one, nothing amiss, and they were in there a while checking every nook and cranny. The manager got maintenance to change our locks and gave us new keys that day. My friend then tells me that for a week, she'd been hearing noises from her bathroom like bottles moving, and when she went to check, she found nothing. I have no idea who I saw going in and out of our rooms, but it looked exactly like my friend. I don't drink or do drugs, not on meds. This was in 2014, and I still freak out when I think about it. Case fall number 1272, written by NMS GTB 0308, The Guardian Angel on Four Legs. Back in 2008, I lived near my college in an apartment. My apartment was set back from the main road quite a bit and was in a wooded and hilly area. One night, I was out running near sundown. I'm at the bottom of the hill that's behind my apartment, so it was near the end of my run. I look up ahead at the top of the hill and notice three guys on bikes just sitting there. Being a 20-year-old female, my spidey senses started tingling. I tell myself I'm psyching myself out and it'll be fine, so I keep running. I'm about halfway up the hill. The three guys are still just sitting there, facing my direction. I don't have a phone or anything and nowhere else to go, so I tell myself I'll just run as hard as I can and scream if I need to. Suddenly, I hear something coming up beside me. I look to my right and see a German Shepherd. He's running alongside me. I've never seen this dog before in my life. I can't explain it, but I just knew I'd be okay now. I continued running up the hill with this random dog beside me. When we're approaching the guys, this dog gets slightly ahead of me and runs directly in front of me instead of to my right. He gets to the guys and stops dead in his tracks. I continue running and pass the guys without even making eye contact. Once I'm past the guys, the dog catches back up to me and continues running alongside me. He stays with me until I take the turn into my apartment's very well-lit parking lot. He disappears into the trees as quickly as he appeared. I took that route at the same exact time every single day for weeks and would drive down that road often hoping to come across him again. No luck, I never saw him again. My friends are all convinced he was a guardian angel making sure I stayed safe. I'm not really a believer, so I don't know. But it's the most creepy, bizarre, and awesome thing to ever happen to me. Case file number 1273, written by Nova Boubert. Maybe I'm already dead? My father passed away over this past winter after a long battle with leukemia. He and I were close, and he actually passed away when my fiance and I were having some issues, and I decided to spend the night at my parents' house. He had wanted me to handle everything when he passed so that my mother wouldn't have to. He knew she'd be a mess and knew I could still maintain a strong exterior even when being an emotional wreck on the inside. So weirdly, it felt like he waited until I was there and unfortunately, the image of him lifeless the next morning is something I don't know if I'll ever get over. Anyway, I decided to stay with my mother for a while, through the holidays at least to help her adjust to being alone for the first time in 50 plus years. I was staying in one bedroom that was upstairs. She still slept in her bedroom on the main floor. My partner and I were still having issues, so I wasn't sleeping well. I was up late most nights and just stressed from all the angles. Was also out of work at the time and stressing about interviews. One night while I'm laying in bed watching TV, I get a text alert. When I look at my phone, I have a message from my mother that reads, I know you're here with me. That seemed like an odd 3am text, so I replied, Are you okay? I didn't get a reply, so I decided to go downstairs and check on her. She was sleeping in her bedroom, snoring away. I was weirded out but figured I'd ask her in the morning if she remembered messaging me and then immediately falling asleep. Before heading back upstairs, I went into the kitchen to grab some water and while passing through the living room, I saw her phone charging on a side table. I grabbed my water and went back upstairs to double check the timestamp on the message, thinking maybe it actually come through earlier or something, maybe some kind of delay, and in the morning I asked my mother about it, and she had no idea what I was talking about. She went and grabbed her phone from the living room, and seemed to be as freaked out as I was. We kind of laughed it off awkwardly, and said it was my dad reaching out from beyond the grave and left it at that. 
but it's always bothered me, the way it was worded. If my dead father were to text me, wouldn't it be, just know, I'm here with you, or I'll always be with you, something along those lines. But instead it said, I know you're here with me, as if I've died too, or I'm soon going to. Or it read like something a living person would say to the dead. I've thought maybe he's in another timeline now where the family is all together, I just don't know. I think about this often because I have no explanation for receiving the text since the phone was in a room alone when I received a message from it, and even resolving to it being delivered much later than it was sent, I do believe my mother in her confusion about it. She didn't send it. She doesn't use her cell phone much anyway and was using it even less because she was overwhelmed by people calling that and the house phone to check in on her. Just needed to get this off my chest and see if there's any other interesting theories about what it might have meant. Maybe I'm dead. Maybe my dad is alive in an alternate universe. Case file number 1274 written by M. Norlery, The Whiskered Guardian Angel A random cat on the street once protected me from a man who I didn't realize was following me. I was, stupidly, talking on my phone while walking home at night. I saw a man who was talking to himself near a park and I deliberately chose to walk down another street to avoid him. In the middle of my phone conversation, this orange cat comes up beside me and starts walking next to me. We walked in tandem for about three blocks, me telling the person I was talking to how funny this was. Suddenly, the cat starts to turn around and head back the other way. I look and see that same man I'd seen earlier, who had changed his original direction and had been following me for a few blocks. The cat got in between us and howled at him until he turned around and went another way. Then the cat and I walked another block together, at which point he peeled off into a yard. I double checked and the man had disappeared. I can't be sure that the man wished me harm, but I know I wouldn't have noticed them if it weren't for the cat. I never believed in guardian angels or anything of that sort until I had that experience. Creepy File Number 116 Written by Sam4WX The Cab Driver's Dark Link I went to the University of Virginia at the same time that Morgan Harrington disappeared, which was my second year there, aka sophomore year. Sadly to say, because she wasn't a student, she was in town for a Metallica concert. Her death was salacious, but it didn't really strike fear into the student body like it did when Hannah Graham would go missing five years later, but I'm getting ahead of myself. About a week or so after Morgan's death in 2009, me and my guy friend were at a grocery store right outside of campus getting snacks around 10pm. Bus service had ended, so we decided to make use of a cab service that the university had set up to make sure students had access to rides in case they were drunk or just needed transpo. The university pays the bill up front and charges you later. So we get into this guy's cab and he immediately starts bringing up Morgan's disappearance. This wasn't so strange because everyone was talking about it. It was national news. But I'm an introvert with a good memory, so I remember just about every conversation over three minutes long I've ever had, especially with strangers. He starts talking about police theories about the case and my friend, who went on to get a masters in gothic horror, starts talking about how some people thought a cult was involved. Basic speculative nonsense. In addition to that, I remember the guy looking at me through the rearview mirror. I won't say I never forget a face, but this conversation was so macabre that it stuck with me even years later. Anyway, he dropped us off and we made it home safe. Fast forward 5 years. I'm in grad school 1000 miles away and Hannah's disappearance is national news. Fortunately in this case, they have video surveillance. You can see her walking away with a big African American guy with dreadlocks. They get an ID and his face is on the news everywhere. I don't recognize him. They eventually catch this guy in Texas, just an hour or so away from where I was in school at the time. As days go by, they're profiling this guy and his DNA matches samples found on Morgan's remains, found three months after her disappearance in 2009. A picture comes up on the screen of what he looked like five years before and my heart stops. There are no dreadlocks, his hair is clean cut, he's about 40 pounds lighter and his beard is short. He is, I'm 97% certain, the same man who drove us home that night. 
He lured both Morgan and Hannah with his cab. Every now and then I think what would have happened if I hadn't have been with my male friend that night. I'm pretty sure it was his idea to go out so late, but still. Or what if he had been a girl? Bonus file, written by the old guy from Up. Spine-tingling footsteps in the night. When I was in third grade, I moved to a new town and into a new house. We lived in a camper in the backyard of the house while we renovated it. It was a pretty old house. Anyway, during renovation, we found all sorts of stuff in the walls. Old bottles, old glasses, letters, old newspapers, old pictures of children in school clothes. It was a two-story house, and the stairs were kind of a focal point for all sorts of creepy stuff. So once you got to the top of the stairs, there was a little landing before it went into two bedrooms. At night, we would always leave the light on in the landing in case we had to get up to use the bathroom. Me and one brother shared a room, and the other room was for our older brother. I refused to sleep upstairs due to how creeped out I was, so I always slept downstairs on the couch. One weekend, my sister, who is older than both my brothers, came to visit and was in my oldest brother's bedroom alone, as we were all at school and my mom was at work. As she was sitting up there watching TV, she heard footsteps coming up the stairs and called out as she had thought my mom was home early from work. No response other than the footsteps turning around and heading back down the stairs. When she got up to look, there was no one home and all doors locked. It doesn't stop there. My oldest brother was left home alone for a week while me and my other brother and mom and dad went on a week-long vacation. Naturally, he had his girlfriend over for a couple nights to keep him company. One night, she got up to pee at around 3 a.m. and went downstairs to the bathroom where she said she heard children whispering. A couple nights later, around 3 to 4 a.m., his girlfriend woke up my brother saying someone was in the house. They heard footsteps coming up the stairs. Since the light was on in the landing, they could see a shadow underneath the door like someone was standing there, and the doorknob began to shake. Luckily, it was locked. They both started to freak out, and my brother jumped out of bed. We had some of those dumb display samurai-type swords that aren't even sharp, and he grabbed one of those and went towards the door. They heard more footsteps running down the stairs, and he bravely or stupidly followed down the stairs where he was met with an empty house. All windows and doors were closed and locked. He called the police, but nothing came of it. Case file number 1275, written by Worthless Commotion, The Midnight Double. My husband recently took an overnight job to help us out. He's only been out there for two weeks and works overnights and evenings, 9pm to 6am. Last night was no different. He left home around 8.15pm. Our daughter, age 11, and I decided to make it a movie night. Around 11 p.m., I heard keys in my back door and the usual sounds my husband makes when he comes home. I creeped out to the kitchen to make sure it was him, and it was. He told me he needed to grab his knee compression sleeve, walk down the hall, said hi to our daughter as he passed the living room, and went upstairs. He came back down, gave me a kiss, and left again. We finished our movie and went to bed. In the morning, when he got home, I made a joking comment about him forgetting his knee sleeve. He was genuinely confused as I recalled the previous night. Our daughter confirmed everything I said and he was still acting confused. I pulled up our security motion camera on my phone to show him when he popped in quickly, but there was no footage from the night before or any other night of him coming home after he's left for work. My daughter and I both heard him, saw him, and I touched him, but he was never home during that time. Nothing else out of the ordinary happened that night. We seriously have no idea what happened. Creepy file number 117 written by American Cheese. The day the school genius vanished. There was a kid in another class at my school in 6th grade that was a genius. I don't mean like, oh, he's really smart because he doesn't need to do the homework and still gets a hundreds. Like he was doing advanced calculus with a local college professor after school. This kid was smarter than everyone. So one day, our computer system for the entire school goes down. I was in a poorer area at the time, so this was normal. This has occurred many times, so normally wouldn't affect us because we barely use laptops and such. The only class that wasn't affected was the computer class. This kid was in that computer class. Three or so hours later, 
When I'm in class with him during social studies, three guys with FBI jackets on and our local chief escorted him out of the building. We were told nothing. The parents were told nothing. It never hit the news. To this day, we have no clue what he did. Except every single teacher I've asked about this says they were also told nothing. I haven't seen the kid since and I can't find a trace of him going on to another school or ending up in trouble. He just fell off the face of the earth with his parents. Yeah, I forgot to mention that parents also disappeared and no one really looked for them after a month or so. Bonus file written by Character Limit Sue When Fearful Screams Echoed Through the Halls A few years ago, I was volunteering with some friends in a remote region of Tanzania. We were there to teach English. But it was total volunteerism. Very few people in the region spoke English because it was completely unnecessary. The type of charity work someone thought up in a boardroom a thousand miles away. Anyway, we were staying in this old hotel up on the top floor, maybe like 6th floor. We chose the top floor for the views, but it also gave us privacy. The hotel was way oversized for the small town it was in. We were more or less the only people staying there. There were probably 20 rooms on the floor and it was all very open. On each floor, a central tiled staircase opened straight into a lobby with the rooms accessed via various hallways. We had two rooms, with two of us in each. The rooms were basic but clean, all tiled. There was also an open window above each door so we could shout out to our friends staying in the room next door. We'd been there a couple of months and got used to having the place to ourselves. No one ever came up beyond the ground floor except the maids on occasion. One of the quietest places I've ever slept. That was until one night. I woke up to see my friend sitting bolt upright. We could hear someone running on the stairs a few floors below. The slapping of the feet on the tiles echoed up the staircase as they ran. Then they started screaming. I saw a woman scream and was guttural, absolutely raw and animalistic. It was a while ago, but I can still hear it clearly. She eventually reaches our floor and starts banging on doors. She's still screaming. She's screaming for help and coming down our corridor. She sounded terrified. By this time I was up, had grabbed a knife we'd bought to cut fruit. Lord knows what I thought I was going to do with it, and I was heading for the door. Just as I reached it, my friend grabs me and drags me back. He gestures for me to stay quiet. I would trust this guy with my life, so I do as I'm told. We stand there in silence in the dark. The woman reaches our thin wooden door. She's slapping on it and screaming out for help. We can hear her so clearly because of the open window above. She's also just a couple of feet away. She's crying out and sobbing, scratching at the door. My friend and I stand in silence just on the other side. We're frozen. Honest to God, I was terrified. After about 10 minutes, we hear her receding down the corridor, no longer crying out so loudly. We hear other people's voices in the stairs and then nothing, as the place falls silent again. I turn to my friend, who looked me dead in the eye. Calmly, he explains, She was shouting in English, mate, all the way. She knew we were here. She knew what door to come to. She also wasn't alone. I heard footsteps on the floor before you woke up. They were trying to get that door open so they could rob us. Had you opened that door, they would have done so. Suddenly, I felt a bit ridiculous with my little fruit knife. I just sat in stunned silence. It made sense. Before long, my friend went back to sleep and I was left with my thoughts. To this day, I have no idea if my friend was right. It still sits with me, whether we could have helped someone that night or not. My gut tells me my friend was right, he usually is. But man, when I think back to how close I came to opening a door. We spoke to the manager and staff next day. None of them had any idea what we were talking about. They were very apologetic though, and even set up a security watch for the rest of our stay. Case file number 1276, written by Bobby DeBob. Unexplained Dome of Light in the Vermont Wilderness. So my brother, myself, and our friend were driving through Vermont heading to a cabin to go snowboarding for the week. I was sitting in my brother's car when I noticed a bright red light, it's night, in the sky. It was coming from deep in the woods but was shining in a huge dome shape. 
The light seemed to be restricted to the dome. The light did not seem to travel far, but it was very bright. We were so baffled, we pulled over at the small gas station on the road to get a better look. There were about six other people who seemed to live there also looking at the light. They were telling us there were no buildings or factories out there whatsoever. As our conversation continued, the light seemed to diminish, but then almost imploded on itself and burst out with a huge white light that lit up the sky and surrounding area. Then about 10-ish seconds after this change, a huge wind gust came at us from the direction of the light. I'd say it was about 15 to 25 mile per hour winds. I hike and I'm just making comparisons to the wind on mountains. Then the light just began to fade away, so we hopped in our cars and kept going. The light didn't fully dim for about 10 minutes. Craziest crap ever. Case file number 1277, written by Axelrod. Mysterious light pursues teens in the dark. Back in high school, I want to say it was my sophomore year, 10th grade. My friends and I used to sneak out of our parents' house late at night, and we used to meet up at the campus and vandalize, smoke, mess around, just stupid troubled teen things. Well, one night, we met up at the school to smoke and hang out. During our session, we noticed a very random and bizarre looking light appear in the baseball dugout next to us. We were in the baseball field dugout. At first we thought that maybe it was a school janitor or guard working late, but we weren't too worried by that thought. We kept our eyes on it as it started moving out of the dugout towards us. Then it finally appeared in the center of the field, in the center of all the plates, where even at night it was fully visible due to the lights, but we saw nothing. Just the light we first noticed, which happened to become brighter as I got closer. We saw no body or silhouette of any kind holding this light. It appeared to be floating. Once I realized that it was just a floating light, I turned to my friends, only to realize that they ran off without me. That's when I decided to grab all the stuff they left behind, throw it in my backpack, and run. As I got a bit of distance from it, I looked back only to see that it had ran through the two fences we had to climb over. That's when I really started crapping my pants, so I started sprinting towards my friends and we ended up running for about half a mile before we lost it in a neighborhood that one of my friends in our friend group had lived in. We hopped this backyard gate to lose whatever was chasing us in the middle of the night. To this day, we don't know what the light was. I've only seen it one other time at the same school while I was taking a run on the track it had. It was definitely the creepiest thing any of my friends and I have experienced. And we're the type who have played with Ouija boards, amateur ghost hunting, and that sort of thing. Nothing ever scared us as bad as this thing. Bonus file written by iBumGaze808 The Mystery of Basement Bangings Just a normal Saturday night. I was watching TV Home Alone with my two dogs when I heard a banging sound coming from the basement. Legit sounded like somebody was just banging on something on the appliances we had down there. Now, there is no access into the basement from down there, only through the upstairs room that I was in and knew nobody could have come in and got past me. So with this knowledge, I was not as scared as you may think, more curious as to what the heck the noise was. One of the two dogs who is a meathead and wants to fight everybody also heard the noise and was now bolting down into the basement to investigate. I get down and see that it is my other dog banging his head into our dryer and chest freezer which are next to each other. My meathead dog just stood there watching confused. So I approach my other dog and calm him down and we all go upstairs. Now this freaked the heck out of me and upset me as it seemed such a very strange behavior for my dog to do. Fast forward only 30 minutes or so. The banging starts again. I instantly look over to my dog, but he's lying down, but now also aware of the noise downstairs. We run down into the basement and there is Meathead now banging his head in between the appliances. Again, I now calm the Meathead down and we all go back upstairs. Nothing has ever happened again since that night, three years now, so that ruled out brain tumors which is what I read online about why maybe dogs bang their heads. But two dogs suddenly on the same night, in the same place, and it only affecting one of them at any given time. Three years and the three of us never talked about that night. A few folks say it may have been a rodent treat or toy they were after. 
No, they were frenzied and hyperventilating. When they get things stuck under anything, they just cry and get me to get their stuff. I guess it boils down to just knowing your dogs. I know instantly from their body language just what the deal was, but that night, I have never seen them so frenzied and upset. Also, it is otherwise a very nice basement, as basements go. I have never had a pest problem down there or any other part of the house. Somebody mentioned that if it only happened three years ago, why did I not make a video of it? My first instinct was to help my dogs to stop them harming themselves. At no point was my first thought to go and grab my phone to capture the moments on film. Case file number 1278 written by Rocco152 The Fatherly Time Warp Chronicles I was pulling an all-nighter with my now ex-girlfriend in the living room at my parents' house when we lived there. It was around 5 a.m. and my dad walked out of his bedroom and passed us to head to work. He stopped and chatted for a couple minutes, but he seemed different. I couldn't quite tell how, but he just seemed a little off, so I chalked it up to him being extra tired. He leaves the house. Not even 10 minutes later, and he comes out of his room to leave for work? You know those scenes in movies where the protagonist witnesses some catastrophic event and the shot focuses on their bewildered face while they gasp and mouth, Oh my god! That was me at that moment. My entire body went numb, and I started panicking. I don't know why, but it really messed my head up. I asked if he just left and came back, but he said he just woke up and he didn't seem off this time, he was normal. Still can't explain what it was. Wasn't like a sleep since I've done the all-nighter thing several times before and after with nothing similar ever happening. I don't expect to know and I honestly will not search for answers. I chalk it up to a glitch in the system or a divergence from one timeline, reality, strand, whatever. Who knows? I sure as hell don't. Bonus file written by Omnipotent Albatross. When laundry machines go wild. For the first year and a half of college, I worked the evening shift, 3 to 11, in a small town hotel that was run by my best friend's mom. The laundry room was connected to the main office, and since it came out into the middle of the hallway, we usually used it as a shortcut if we were going to check on a guest room. Everybody would leave by 8pm, and the evening shift would work the last few hours alone. We primarily served week-long business stays, so it was pretty quiet. My first day alone, a housekeeper was teasing me about a ghost that haunted the hotel. I laughed it off. That night, when I was alone, I used the laundry room as a shortcut. I was halfway through the laundry room when all of the washing machines and dryers kicked on at the same time. I flew out of the room. I never really mentioned it to anybody, and in the back of my mind, I told myself that maybe everything had been sent on a timer or something. I never had any more issues until a year and a half later on my last day of working there. Earlier in the week, I had an unsettling experience with a guest. He was embarrassed to borrow a plunger. He returned it by coming in through the unsecured laundry room, came all the way into the back office, and left the plunger in the middle of the room. He intentionally came in very quietly and never announced he was in the office or anything. I just turned the corner from the front desk and found the plunger in the middle of the room. Due to that, I had shut the door between the laundry room and the office. It was my last hour of work, and I suddenly heard what sounded like three drunk men arguing in the laundry room from the other side of the door. It was so loud and I kept hearing the clink of beer bottles, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. I called my best friend, who worked the night shift and was the manager's son. He could hear the voices arguing through the phone too. The situation felt so surreal and even though I objectively knew it was a dumb idea, I opened the door to tell the guys to go to bed. As soon as I opened the door, the voices stopped and the room was completely empty. I blew it off, but it was so weird that my first and last day involved such strange experiences. Bonus file written by K.R. Steele When Revenge and the Supernatural Collide I went to a boarding school, as my dad was in the military, and for a few years he was moved around way more than the normal every three years. It was full of other kids in that sort of situation, so it was a bit rougher than what people usually think of when they hear boarding school. There was a lot of bullying and fighting. 
We would also make up stupid ghost stories to scare our dorm mates. One of them was about this former pupil called Peter who went crazy and killed the teacher before running away. There were woods nearby and a few caves. It was said that he lived in one of them and would sneak back into the school to steal food and clothes from the dorms. There used to be a challenge to go to the caves near dark and run into the largest one and touch a stone outcropping that was just before the cave took a turn off the side. Hardly anyone had the balls to do it. One day, me and some of my friends were messing around near the caves. I was playing with one of my toys that I brought to school. It was a slightly repainted G.I. Joe salvo figure with a new head I'd swapped in because I didn't like him bald. Some of the kids who used to give us a hard time sort of snuck up on us and gave us the usual beating. Then one of them threw my toy into the cave, laughing at how Sneaky Pete would have fun with it. After they left, I tried to go in and find it, but couldn't, and I ended up getting freaked out. This ate away at me for weeks, so I planned my revenge. The bullies would usually always go to the cave after dinner to challenge a few kids to go in to prove they were cool. I snuck away from dinner early and got changed into all black clothing and a ski mask. I waited till I could hear the kids coming, then snuck into the cave, right to the back, behind the stone, and waited. They stood outside for a while, but eventually, one of the bullies tried to prove how tough he was by going to touch the stone. I waited till he got real close, then jumped out and yelled. Everyone started screaming and running in all directions. I felt pretty good. Strangely, my revenge had overcome any fear I had. I didn't really think that I was there in the cave, alone in the dark. Anyway, the scary bit is on the way back. I put my hand in my pocket and found my G.I. Joe. It chilled me to the core. Now I know that I probably just found it there and subconsciously put it away while I was focused on the scare, but I have no memory of it, and I had changed my clothes before coming to the cave. It still gives me the creeps. Case file number 1279 written by Anonymous. The picture that cannot exist. It was summer 1975, and we visited the Magic Kingdom on a weekend. Back in those days, Disney was working the ticket system. You paid to get in the park, and at the same window, you bought tickets to be used within the park. The tickets were designated A through E, with an E ticket being for the best rides in the park. As I recall, It's a Small World was an A ticket ride, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride was a C ticket ride, and much later, Space Mountain would be an E ticket ride. In our group was Dad, Mom, my sister Kim, and I. We had a great day and documented the trip with our Polaroid SX-70. A word about how our family worked. Dad was the photographer, period. No one would ever use a camera except for him. However, I, age 13, took the underdeveloped photos and fanned them until they developed. I was the man. If you do not remember how these cameras worked, please Google it. We thought they were great. After lunch, we were walking by the Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea ride, and I wanted to go on it. I had my e-ticket, but Dad stopped me short. He was, as usual, short and sharp. Son, think for a minute. That ride submerges under the water. We're not going on it. Think for a minute. I heard that come out of his mouth at least 500 times in my life. Why, Dad? What if it breaks while we're submerged? Me, derisively. Um, okay, right, Dad. Son, when it comes to machines, it's an imperfect world. Things break all the time. What if the mechanic for that ride had a bad day yesterday? We are not going underwater on that thing. And that was that. I was a bit crestfallen, and Dad tried to throw me a bone. He offered to take a picture of the Nautilus as it cruised by. So I was mollified. After all, it was a chance to fan an undeveloped photo. Mom and Kim dropped back, and Dad went to the rail. We watched as he bent over the rail facing the lagoon and snapped a shot of his submarine as it traveled by on its underwater rail. Out popped the white photo with a weir and a click, and he handed it to me to fan. I did so, and we walked on, me contentedly fanning another photo. 
In a moment, I looked at the developed photo and for a moment I did not understand what I was looking at. I called that over and showed him. In the photo was the lagoon, the nautilus, a black area on the right, and the back of my father's head? Wait, what? The back of my dad's head was in the picture? Impossible. He leaned over the rail and snapped the shot himself. We watched him do it. There should have only been the sub and the lagoon in the frame. It was as if I had held the camera over my head behind him and snapped a picture, but that had not happened. Remember, only dad was the photographer, no exceptions. I watched dad take the photo while leaning over the rail. So did mom. It was genuinely an image which could not exist, and yet there it is. Dad looked at the photo and said, Well, crap, Kidoski. Told you we weren't going on that ride. Kidoski was his nickname for me at times. Dad was a product of his era, early adulthood in the 1940s. Show no weakness. He appeared to shrug it off. But years later, mom would tell me that he later broke down and cried in front of her and asked what it could have possibly meant. Was it a message about his mortality? He would die six years later of mesothelioma, but I never connected the two incidents in my heart. After all, we all have a shelf life. I give you an impossible photo that mom, Kim and I watched be taken. What appeared on the print should not exist. To this day, 46 years later, it remains one of the true mysteries in my life and now you all know about it. Creepy File Number 118 Written by Bart The Malignant Whispers I was young, maybe 12 or 11. My sister, 14, and I were alone in the house playing the card game Rummy on our living room floor while she was complaining about her boyfriend at the time. We were listening to a Gloria Estefan tape. This was a long time ago, don't judge. Just when my sister's complaining was reaching a high point, the tape's music faded out and then all of a sudden you could hear a man's voice screaming at us through the speakers. Shut up! I'm sick of hearing it! Then the music faded back in. We were panicking. We ran to the couch on the other side of the living room, as far away from the stereo as we could get, and huddled together while crying like babies. She ended up calling her boyfriend, of course, to come over. After she hung up with him, the tape faded out again, and this time, a woman's voice came up over the speakers and said, No matter how hard you try, no one's coming for you. This time we lost our damn minds. We ran out of the front door and down the stairs to the yard to wait for our savior. We told our mom and she said that the stereo must have picked up a CB radio or something, but we told her that we were listening to a tape, not on the radio. The function that can pick up the outside radio waves wasn't even on. When we replayed the tape later, it was just music, so no one taped over anything. The neighbor that lived downstairs was an older man from a different country with a heavy accent and his even older mother who didn't speak our language at all. The other neighbors on either side of our house couldn't have possibly heard my sister complaining. She wasn't yelling or even speaking much louder than a basic tone anyway. It was one of many strange and scary things that happened in that house. Case File Number 1280 Written by Mr. Hella Fresh I Dodged the Grim Reaper's Scythe I was 18 at the time, having just finished high school and went with my friends to the beach on our motorcycles. 18 is a legal driving age. A friend had just gotten his bike modified and recommended that I take it for a spin. Stupid 18 year old me said sure, left my helmet behind and got on with shorts and a t-shirt. Note here that it was the second time driving that bike and it had no ABS, automatic braking system. I was driving for like 10 minutes on a straight country road and eventually decided to head back. On my way there, I was really speeding, stupid 18 year old me, and decided to overtake the car in front, gear down revving, and just as I'm approaching to overtake, the driver decides to do a U-turn out of the blue. I do not recall much from my reaction. I slammed on the brakes and then saw a sort of flashback of my family's faces thinking that I would never see them again. Then, some seconds later, I realized that I stopped, literally a yard or two away from the driver's door, and she was eyes wide, staring frozen at me. 
I recall the time of overtaking the car and my speed and honestly, I cannot tell how I did not die there. This changed my life, the way I think, and gives me the chills every time. Case file number 1281, written by Chili Dog. My lost license materialized five years later. In 2009, my wallet and Blackberry were stolen at a gas station. I replaced my cards then move on with my life. In 2014, I got a new to me truck. It was a 2012 fleet truck with about 30,000 miles, and I was pretty happy with it. It had been a Comcast truck in the next state over, and was in pretty good shape and had an awesome utility box on top. The dealership was near my parents' house, so I took it there, and my dad and I were combing through it finding things like the spare tire jack and stuff. We found my driver's license under the passenger seat. I figured I'd forgotten to put it away at the dealership and it fell on the floor, so I opened up my wallet to put it up. I had a license in my wallet. The license that was under the seat was the one that was stolen in 2009, in a truck from a different state that hadn't even have been built at the time of the theft, and I just happened to purchase this truck five years later. Case file number 1282, written by Satch1987, Tinsel, Eggnog, and Ghosts. We used to have a night out every Christmas with the lads from high school. We went back to one of the lads' house and were all drunk having a good time, when one of the lads pointed into the kitchen and said, Who's that? The kitchen was like a box room where you could see the whole room from the doorway. I had my back to the wall where it was and turned to look in. The lights were off and there was no one there. We all looked and said, What are you looking at? He was adamant and just pointing and just said, no, who are those two there? The lad whose house it was was looking in and turned on the light and again, there was no one there. And we all said, are you okay? What are you on about? He said, look, that fella is leaning on the worktop and the other is leaning and pointing and laughing at me. We all kept saying there was no one there. After back and forth for about 10 minutes, he was describing what they were wearing, etc. And then the lad who could see these people realized we couldn't and started freaking out, tearing up and shaking uncontrollably, saying he had to get out of the house. He was shaking that much that we had to put his shoes on for him. Once he had gone and been drunk, no drugs that we knew of, we just laughed it off as him being off and on one, but the lad to whose house it was said he described his uncle and granddad who had been long since dead, exactly how they used to stand and what clothes they were wearing. I wouldn't have believed it if I wasn't there. And honestly, I still think he just had a mad episode. We have all met his granddad and uncle before they died, so it could have been some mental moment he had. To this day, anytime we mention it, he refuses to talk about it and doesn't even entertain any notion of it. Like I said, it sounds far-fetched, but that it is 100% true. I don't believe in ghosts, etc., and still think he had a moment, but it was genuinely weird and unsettling. Bonus file written by Anonymous, my feline angel's final cuddle. I was living in Boston. I was woken up at 3 a.m. or so by my cat jumping on my bed and curling in between my calf muscles and going to sleep. My cat has done this every night since I was five years old. That was his spot. It was something I was very familiar with. Thing is, at the time, my cat was living with my parents on the west coast so I couldn't understand what the hell I just felt. But I knew it was my cat, I just figured I was dreaming. I got a call from my parents the following morning that my cat died around midnight the previous night, three hours behind since I was on the east coast. Guess that was my cat traveling to Boston to come see me one last time. I wasn't dreaming, I remember it quite well. I said maybe I was dreaming because I am doubtful of myself, but thinking back, yeah, I was wide awake and realized my experience. Despite being a fun believer in ghosts, suspension of disbelief, I haven't had any other experiences other than this. This is my own experience, and I expected and appreciate the doubt, but call it what you will, my cat came to see me. Case file number 1283, written by Necra Me, Hole in Space Time vs. Heroic Dog. Lived on a 600 acre farm in Arkansas absolutely no one around for miles and miles and miles. 
was out feeding the animals after getting home late one night, just finishing up and taking the buckets back out to the barn. As I was locking up the feeding barn, we had a herding dog. It was a corgi. It was just going absolutely nuts and running into the woods. So I instantly went to investigate to make sure that the animals would be alright. Had a handheld spotlight, shining it into the woods, saw nothing. The dog was just going absolutely nuts, still, and I finally saw him running between these trees towards this, like, black splotch? Was it somewhat humanoid shaped? But it went in at it and the things just seemed to absorb the light. I've never seen anything like it. Closest would be like an opaque stone, how it doesn't reflect the light but just kind of nullifies it. Regardless, the dog suddenly was tossed up over my head, over the electric fence which is above 6 feet in height and at least 9 feet back towards the fence. I absolutely booked it back to the house to get the shotgun and when I came back the dogs were still barking but the thing was gone? So I shot the shotgun in an attempt to scare whatever it was away and it seemed to have worked so I didn't see it again. Dogs all come back to the house, feed and water them. Give them all the good boy treats for protecting the animals. Now here's the part that made it mega hard to cope with and it really, really upset me. The next day, that specific dog who chased in after whatever this was wound up dead with its neck snapped completely backwards on the edge of the woods. I was in shock and grief at the time. I didn't really think about it, but still to this day I have no idea what that was and the thought of it just makes me sick to my stomach. Case file number 1284, written by Weesh. Did I predict my friend's words? I was in ninth grade and my friend, Donna, invited me to accompany her and her parents to a barbecue at the up north vacation home, it's a Michigan thing, of one of her relatives. I'd never been there before, had never met these aunts, uncles and cousins. There was a badminton net set up on the property. And since Donna and I had recently had a badminton unit in gym class, we went into the storage unit slash pole barn to search out the rackets and shuttlecocks. At one point while she was digging through sacks of stuff, she commented something like, I think, cousin, Karen's husband is kinda creepy. The thing was, I looked directly at Donna and spoke that line completely in unison with her. I'd had a very sudden flash, as if I'd been in this exact place in this situation before and knew what she was going to say as soon as she paused and looked up at me. Donna of course was stunned and asked me how I knew what she was going to say. Déjà vu, I replied, still trying to understand it myself. She was unfamiliar with the term other than the literal translation. Already seen? She asked. I tried to explain that I didn't know if I'd seen the scenario in a dream or what, but she was weirded out by it as was I. Case file number 1285, written by Solemn Luna. Space time as a pretzel. Lots of weird stuff has happened to me in my life. So either I'm haunted by some trickster god type of crap, or stuff just tends to get strange naturally around me, and I'm too stupid to figure out what's going on. I've chosen three things that I absolutely can't explain, and had other people witness it too. The first story takes place at a friend's apartment around 15 years ago. We were watching TV and just talking, and the subject turned to ghosts for some reason. I told her that I believed that there was something more in this world that we still didn't understand, but she just laughed and said that she never believed in that kind of stuff and never would. She then shouted for the ghosts in the room to show themselves, just to mess with me. She waited, smirking, for a few seconds, and then we heard what sounded like a heartbeat, like rhythmic thumping. We looked around for a second and found the source almost immediately. It was my purse. It was laying on the table in front of us, pulsating like a heart. I grabbed it and emptied it, but we couldn't find anything that could have caused a weird heartbeat. The second story takes place around the same time, but in another friend's house. He had told me on several occasions that he often heard footsteps in his living room, but I figured that it was probably creaky floors or pipes since it was an old house. But one night when my sister and I were at his place, we heard them as well. It was clear as day. Someone was walking in heavy boots it sounded like from his kitchen into his living room and stopped right in front of the couch we were sitting on. The last story happened to me and my dad when I used to live with him and my sister. 
My dad and I were sitting in the living room and watching a movie one night. My sister was in her room studying. When I sat in the living room, you could see the hallway to the left that began in my sister's room, went past the living room and all the other rooms and ended up at the office where the family computer was. Both me and my dad saw my sister walk past from her room to the office. We both turned and looked at her. Two minutes later, we saw her again, walking the exact same direction. Me and my dad looked at each other and he pointed out how weird it was that we never saw her go back the other way. And if he saw her again, he would ask her what she was doing. And sure enough, a few minutes later, she walked again from her room to the office. My dad called out for her and asked her if she was in the office. She then walked out of her room again and said no, why did he ask? We have no idea who or what we saw that night, wandering the same route again and again, repeating, and my dad still considered it the weirdest thing he's ever experienced. Case Notes File 1286, written by Joyce's Raven 13, a physicist's perspective on quantum immortality. I've always been confident of my experiences and observations. That's been something about myself I've always liked. There are plenty of things that I'm awful at, but I've built a career in anthropology on observing things other people don't see until I've pointed them out, and I trust my perceptions. Despite this innate confidence, however, it has been validating to find out that other people have had the I died and jumped timelines experience, too. My own experience finds its seeds in the absolute worst period of my life, an 18th month span that started in the spring of 2015. I'd been through hard times as a homeless youth after having to leave home and school at 16, but just before the events that exploded in 2015, I was having a good life. I was married to someone I loved deeply, I had a great career, great friends, and enjoyed volunteering for my community by teaching martial arts to survivors of DM violence and running a special needs animal sanctuary on my land. Unfortunately, over the course of this 18 month span, both of my parents were diagnosed as terminal with rare and terrible brain conditions. I started caring for them, traveling constantly to take my mom to chemo in another state and helping my dad find new ways to communicate as he lost his ability to speak. In the midst of this, my wife left me for a student of mine whom she'd been having an affair with. Crushingly, my service dog had to be put down a week after my wife left after she had an intractable seizure. Then, the worst thing happened, or the worst two things, I suppose. My dad died, and I was assaulted the same night by someone who was supposed to be there to support me. The assault was so bad that I had to have two surgeries, and I ended up literally losing parts of myself. I included all of this to give context to the next part. The day after I got home from my second surgery, I remember only two things. The first was posting on social media that I needed to place all the animals at my sanctuary. The last was smiling strangely at myself in the bathroom mirror later that day. Then nothing. I woke up late the next day, around 4pm, sicker than I have ever been. I had the worst headache ever and I started vomiting. I pushed myself along the floor to the bathroom. For quite a while, an hour or two, maybe more, I laid on the bathroom floor, unable to move. I finally got up and lunged my way to the kitchen, thinking that I needed to hydrate or I wasn't going to make it, confused as to why I felt so awful. As I dizzily tried to stand and clumsily grabbed a glass from the cupboard, I saw it. There on the kitchen counter was an empty bottle of the strong pain medication that had been full when the hospital sent it home with me after my surgery the day before. I had a horrible, sinking feeling. I realized that I had taken the whole bottle. There had been 60 pills. I immediately thought that there was no way I could have lived through taking that many pills, yet there I stood. The fact that I didn't even remember doing it was alarming. It did explain the nausea and headache and being out of it to the point that I couldn't even care for the animals, which never happened even if I had to crawl. I was shocked. Yes, I had been through hell over the last months, losing so much. But in addition to the 26 animals that I loved dearly and who depended on me, I was still very close to my sister and had a grown child who meant the world to me. I would never have consciously made a decision to end things. Nevertheless, 
The proof that I had reached a limit to what I could handle sat there on the counter, the empty bottle staring at me like a dead eye, open wide. In the immediate aftermath of this event, I felt like I had inexplicably dodged a bullet, defying death. I went to counseling and found other supports for my grief and exhaustion. I tried to get back to a semblance of normality. However, things never did feel right. The people who've experienced quantum immortality know exactly what I'm talking about. There was an undeniable dissonance between me and what was supposed to be my life. I knew that something had drastically shifted, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Nothing seemed real. It wasn't dissociation, it was like I had suddenly been set down a whole different life, one that was thinner. I use that term because it almost feels like I was a ghost. I remember that the thought started pushing into my mind that I hadn't dodged a bullet, but that I had actually died that fateful day and was living in some sort of second reality. Not knowing about quantum immortality at this point, I did research on believing that you are dead and found out that there is a very rare condition in which people inexplicably believe they are dead and slowly rotting away. I think it's called Cotard Syndrome. I didn't feel like I was dead exactly, and I didn't feel like my body was decomposing, but I grasped at the idea that maybe that was what was going on with me. It wouldn't be surprising if my mind was off kilter after all that had happened. I just needed time. It slowly became clear though that it was far more than that. At first, it was small things. I didn't remember certain events or interactions or remember them the right way according to friends and acquaintances. I realized that I felt differently about people I had known for a long time, more positively or more negatively. My tastes and preferences changed. Still, I knew that a near-death experience could cause changes in personality, so I continued to push away the idea that I had somehow jumped into another timeline to the periphery. Push it away as I might though, an awareness that something foundational had shifted was beginning to override traditionally rational assessments. Though I had kept it to myself, and even continued to try to contain it in my subconscious, I started thinking in terms of my prior life being on one timeline and the one I'm living now being on a different one. As I leaned into finding happiness despite this undercurrent of disruption, I got together with someone I had a deep attraction toward over several decades. In my lifetime before, we had never had an opportunity to date because we were always out of sync and dating other people whenever our lives crossed paths. But in this timeline, we were both free when we ran into each other again and we finally had our chance. I remember thinking to myself that maybe this is why I switched timelines, to have the relationship with her that we had always been meant to have, though I kept that buried in my private thoughts. It was during the early part of our relationship that the first major jolt occurred that forced my buried thoughts to the surface. I knew something was profoundly and irrefutably off when I mentioned to her the trip she and I took to see my family 15 years before. She looked at me like I was from Neptune. She had no memory of the trip at all. She said I must be thinking about the trip that we took right before she left for college when we were kids, when we had taken an initial trip to introduce her to my family when I first fell for her. But the second trip I was talking about occurred when we were in our 30s and 40s. At that time, our lives had come together unexpectedly again, and we had contemplated dating, as she was in an open relationship and my relationship just prior had ended. The purpose of the second trip was to reintroduce her to my family after so many years and for her and I to have a chance to talk about our possible future. I remember her getting into my family's town on the train, how nervous I was, picking her up, what she wore over the course of the trip, the products that she was using at the time, for example, a rose water spray for her face. I remember the special and specific dishes that my mom had made for us. My mom's cooking history is very distinct as people in the family changed their dietary needs and convictions over the years. I even remember that this woman was not used to eating the kinds of foods my mom made and got a terrible stomach ache. She had laid on the floor and put her legs up on a particular post in her house to try to alleviate the cramping as I did what I could to help her feel better. I remember the exact spot where we made out on the hill next to my parents' house 
and exactly everything we talked about as we were sitting there, as it was the first time I'd kissed her, and it was obviously a memorable moment. I remember timing things so that I could ride the train back with her when she left. I remember the train ride home with her on the second trip, and how there was hardly anyone on the train, so we each got to spread out and have our own seats. After the first trip, she left alone, and I traveled to Illinois with my mom. We talked long and seriously about starting a relationship, but made the decision that the timing wasn't right, as my son was still quite young and needed my full attention. Though she remembers our lives crossing paths again at the time, she had no memory of the second trip and all of the things that transpired during it. She kept insisting that I must be remembering the first trip, despite my ability to reel off all kinds of distinguishing details about the second trip that proved it had to have happened later. I kept telling her that the first trip was quite distinct in my memory, and our memories matched in regard to the details of the first trip. All to no avail. We simply had different memories. Further, my family had no memory at all of her making that second trip to see them, either. Her sister, who she shares everything with, also has no memory of the second trip. As we talked more about our memories of the many times we wove into each other's lives over the decades, things we did together, talked about, there were all kinds of discrepancies between our memories. Beyond very different memories of our lifelong relationship, it was plain that in this timeline, we just weren't compatible. Though we finally had the chance to be together, we just weren't resonating, and sadly, we broke our engagement. Soon, after our heartbreaking parting of ways, I went to visit my sister, who always made me feel better. We hadn't had much time to reminisce over the last years, with our parents' illnesses, my dad's death, my romance and its end, and so forth. It was nice to have a chance to talk about our shared history. As we chatted, I commented on the lion collage that I had made for her, which was hanging over her desk. I was sharing my very clear memories of cutting up my dad's many camping catalogs and making different shapes to create this big lion collage for her. I laughed about cutting a whole tent out of a catalog to use as a nose. I said that every time I looked at it above her desk now, I would feel the same slight twinge of annoyance I felt when I made it, realizing that a couple of the lines were off. But my sister looked at me, obviously perplexed, and said that she had equally clear, detailed memories of her and my dad making the collage together as they sat at his desk in our old house. I finally told her about my growing awareness that my memories were not all gelling with the people around me. She had already had a glimpse of this when we discussed the trip that never happened with my ex-fiance, but now I really opened up about feeling like I was living a different, second life since that fateful day. She knew me and believed what I was saying. We started going through various important family memories, first just the two of us and then the whole family, and it quickly became clear that I had all kinds of different memories than they did. I'm lucky that they were all open-minded and supportive of my experiences. Still, it has been a difficult adjustment. It feels like I've lost an entire lifetime. I really feel for the people here who have gone through this. It creates a terribly unique kind of grief, and there is absolutely nowhere to process it unless you find other true personal accounts like the one shared here. The stories other people have shared about experiences similar to mine have meant so much. Once I learned about it, quantum immortality made a great deal of sense to me. I am an amateur physicist, particularly enthusiastic about theoretical physics and I can see where my experiences could be perfectly natural if certain current theories are indeed true. I still discover things that I remember differently, things that I remember doing that never happened in this existence or vice versa. There are significant Mandela effects that are dissonant between my memories and those of the larger culture or historical timeline. Interestingly, things continue to shift like things that I have done since I woke up after that splitting episode, will change and disappear and then come back again like I'm jumping back and forth. I'd love to hear if other quantum survivors have also experienced this. I'm not asking for anyone to explain this away. I am a trained observer and an academic. This series of events has been an empirical, lived experience for me. I feel like there's nothing to do but embrace it as the way things are. Final Notes one advantage that I've had in this situation is access to good medical care. 
since these things started to happen. I've had CT scans, MRIs, exhaustive screenings for mental health issues, dementia, Alzheimer's, brain damage, and batteries of other tests to rule out known psychological and organic causes. All concluded that I am perfectly normal, though I realize the term is somewhat limp in the face of how little human beings know. I currently run an intellectually challenging and rewarding program at a top university, maintain my long-term friendships, remain close to my family, am an author with several books and peer-reviewed papers. I have an advanced black belt and still run my own dojo. I don't mention any of these things to brag. Now more than ever, I realize how connected everything is and how little I have done on my own. All of these achievements rest on my connection to other people who have helped me and the ideas and actions of an infinite web of people. But such achievements are accepted in society as marks of a well-balanced person, though there are obviously notable exceptions if the news is any indication. I list the stable attainments in my life to challenge the notion that people who have these experiences are all unstable crackpots. I cringe when I hear the empty term, crazy. I think that people's experiences with quantum immortality are real and are significant phenomena that we should be paying attention to. I think that the implications are profound in regard to our understanding of life, reality, the universe, everything. I think that everyone here should consider themselves pioneers who've had the opportunity to actually boldly go where few have gone before. I hope people continue to share their stories. The reason it took me so long to fully embrace my perceptions, despite my confidence in them, was that I simply wasn't ready after all that loss to grieve my old life, and further, I literally had no framework from which to reconstruct my orientation towards reality. On this side of things though, I'm actually okay with everything that's happened and I've started to understand the positive aspects of my experiences. Thank you. Case file number 1287, written by God1643, The Hitchhiker from Hell. I live in a relatively rural area. Five minutes up the road from me is all farmland and cattle pastures. There is a lake that we overlook and a hill further behind us. Up on that higher hill, there have been stories of weird happenings for decades. Figures on the side of the road that vanish, people offering rides to people only for the person to disappear into thin air halfway through their response, even one story of a pregnant woman who was kidnapped and later found walking on the road trying to get to a hospital. Those stories have been passed around in our community since about the late 1950s. Everybody kind of knows not to drive on that road late at night, but it was much higher speed limit than my road and a convenient cut through halfway down my road. Using the cut through cuts the time to get from the main road to my house by a full 5 minutes or so, and I was tired one night. I'm driving along, alone in my truck. It's a warm summer night. I've got the windows rolled down and I'm bopping to some kind of country song. Can't remember which one, but I know it was Glenn Campbell. On the side of the road is a very tall figure, probably near 6 foot 6, 200 centimeters, wearing a baggy black hoodie. I slow down and drop my left window, offer him a ride in the bed of my truck if he needs to go down the road a bit. He's handsome, chiseled jaw, patchy black beard, brown eyes and very pale skin. He drops the hood to make better eye contact and doesn't smile so much as his face goes less frowny. No sir, that's alright. I prefer this kind of ambience, keep my mind on how it should be. I make sure he's certain mainly out of politeness, the road has harsh, very rocky sides, and I don't want him slipping because it had rained earlier in the day. He smiles a bit, and it's then that I remember what I've heard about this road. Something seems off. He smiles fine, nothing weird, teeth are a bit crooked but they're clean and white. Really sir, I appreciate the offer. You're awfully kind. He speaks with a southern accent, kind of like my cousins, but not more Tennessee than the rally. He rolls his L noises and speaks slowly. Have a good night. I nod and roll up the window and turn the music back up. As I'm pulling away, I check the side view mirror. He's still casually walking, maybe a bit fast because of the length of his legs, but it's still a walk. I get a bit of the way down the road, cruising at about 45 or so, and a minute later I look in the mirror. He is the same distance from me. He is running now, and keeping the same distance from my truck which is moving at 45 miles per hour. 
I'm freaking the freak out naturally, and it's as I look harder into the mirror that I notice something is weird. He's got the hood back up, but I can still see his eyes. They're green. Reflective green like a dog's. I floor it, and he stops running after me, slowing down his steps, and I hear his laughter. It echoes all the way down the hill of the cut through to my home. I sat up the entire night, had every door locked and a bat in my hands. I did not sleep until about two days later when my parents got worried and drove me to my godmother's house and her husband stayed up with a shotgun pointed at the door to keep me calm. His laughter was in my nightmares. Bonus file written by Eastern Fonda, 6162. Walking in darkness and in love. I was very depressed a year ago. Tired all the time, hopeless and numb. I had no more tears to cry and was done with life. But I was too much of a coward to end things. The love of my life ghosted me for another girl. He was my friend and my confidant. All my friendships ended. I felt like life was passing me by. Between college and my internship, I would sleep all day and eat fast food. I hated life and myself for not being enough for anyone or even myself. I would stare at myself in the mirror and say ugly things about myself. I was isolated from everyone. One night, every inch of emotion came back and in tears, I asked God why he hated me so much. Why can't I just be happy? Why am I not enough? Why do you hate me, God? because every time I took a step forward, I would fall down 10 steps back. The next day, a Friday, after my classes had ended, I took an Uber to my internship. Around 6 p.m. my internship ended, and it was time to order an Uber home. But no Ubers were available, so I tried a different app, but somehow my debit card was not working. So I had no choice but to walk 30 minutes home, which isn't bad at all for me, but I was mentally exhausted back then. I took a shortcut through my college campus to feel safer. As I'm walking, very slowly, I feel that someone is following me and is kind of trying to catch up with my pace. So I move to the side to let this person pass me. When I got a glimpse of this person, I could tell it was a very short Asian female, maybe 4 foot 10, 11, and she was dressed like a little kid. She gets really close, I mean personal space and smiles at me and tells me her name. I didn't want to talk to anyone. I was angry at life and didn't want to entertain anyone. But I told myself, don't be rude, it's not her fault your life's a mess. So I put on a smile and introduced myself. Then she said, I just want to tell you that God loves you very much. Then we parted ways. I was blown by this. Just the night before, I had asked the Almighty why he hated me so much and now he was telling me that he loves me through what I believe to be a human angel. I tried to maintain myself, but I was overwhelmed by the emotions. I got home and broke down like a baby. Maybe I'm not alone after all. It's fall number 1288, written by Spetsy55. My impossible odyssey, surviving for three days in 114 Fahrenheit heat. I was living in a very rural mining town called Mount Isa City. I was running at national level at the time, so my dad would drive me out to creek beds to train in my longer runs. We decided to go on a new creek about one hour drive away. I made the mistake of following this dry creek for an hour run that turned at 90 degrees. It was so hot by that time, and I was so thirsty. I thought if I cut across at 45 degrees back, I should meet back at the creek while cutting my running distance significantly. What I didn't know was that this creek had off branches that twisted and turned slowly away from the direction of the road. I found one of those off branches, thinking that it was the creek bed that I was in earlier. I continued running. Eventually I realized I should have well and truly been back at the car. I climbed a tree to see if I could see the road and couldn't. By that time, I was hopelessly lost. I was 17, in the Australian outback, for three days, and almost died of thirst. These were 46 degrees Celsius, 114.8 Fahrenheit, days, and I was delirious towards the end. I was tripping over constantly, running into trees, falling asleep, standing up and walking on the ground and hallucinating. I laid down to die and dreamt of a dam surrounded by cows with weeping willows planted near it. 
When I woke up, I was totally calm and clear-headed. I also seemed to have strength back, so I got up and started walking again. That night, I was getting very bad again, but made it to the end of a dry creek bed, the one I was following. I was going to turn left, but something in me kept telling me to go right. I walked maybe an extra one kilometer and walked straight into the water. I was that bad that it was up to my waist and before I realized I was in water. That night, I drank and drank and kept falling asleep. In the morning, I woke up to find I was in a dam, surrounded by thirsty cattle and with weeping willow trees that had been planted around it. To this day, I now believe in a higher power because it was identical to my dream. A day later, a small helicopter passed overhead and I was rescued. I had found the only water source within a 100 kilometer radius and made a full recovery after being in intensive care for a week. Creepy File Number 119, written by Lise Baby 6253 My Unexplained Naked Midnight Run When I was 12, I traveled to England for three weeks with a group called People to People. During the last week there, we were back in London at some hotel that I vaguely remember still having fire escapes on the outside windows of the rooms. Around bedtime, the chaperones would make sure we were in our rooms, then put tape on the outside of the doors. This was their way of seeing if we had snuck out at any point. Me and my roommate that night, Ryan, went to sleep as normal after the room check. Then I wake up in the middle of the night, it's dark, but I'm naked now which wouldn't be alarming typically because I've been known to undress while sleepwalking. Somewhere deep down in me though, I was scared, dreadfully scared, like my life was in danger, so I ran. I ran through the hall, completely naked, and without looking at the room number, somehow I knew I was on the wrong floor of the hotel. I take the elevator to my floor, find my room, and the tape is still on my door. Ryan answers and is very confused. He doesn't know how I got out of the room and neither do I. I put on my PJs and go to sleep. I thought it was a dream. I woke up with a different shirt on though. The first thing out of Ryan's mouth was, how did you get out of the room last night? He tried to tell some more of the kids at breakfast what had happened and a few said it was impossible. I did not want to pursue telling anyone about it so I told Ryan to let it go. He seemed irritated by that. I still have no idea exactly how I got out of the room, or whose room I woke up in. The only person who would know anything is Ryan, but there was no social media in 2005 and now I've forgotten his last name. Still messes with me daily, decades later. Bonus file written by Nectarine Du 8903 From Balloons to Military Nightmares I've had some strange experiences throughout my life, as we all have. Everyone gets truly creeped out by something at least once in their lives, but this one is the most memorable for me. The one that stands out as different from their others, more concrete. This is the only time I've ever seen something with my own eyes. This happened about 22 years ago. I was 8 years old. Me and my little brother lived with my father in North Alabama. My mother lived with her mom in Chickamauga, Georgia. We didn't really get to see my mom much due to issues my dad had with her. General irresponsibility on her part sometimes. Anyways, Chickamauga, Georgia is where the first part of the Civil War was fought, resulting in the most significant Union defeat in Western theater. There is a large area of Chickamauga that is a park now. I mean, it's huge. Well, my grandma, my mom's mom, lived right on the edge of the battlefield area. We didn't really know this or comprehend this at the time, because it was just common knowledge around the area. No one really talked about it. People would take their kids there to fly kites on the huge fields or to see a big tower you could climb up. Well, we had a party for my cousin at my grandma's house. It was specifically Christmas time, because my grandma had her tree up in the living room. We were there for a visit and to spend the night. Everyone had a good time and it started getting late. So my mom had pulled out the couch in the living room and that was where me and my little brother were going to sleep. My cousin slept on the floor in front of the bed. I went to sleep and woke up in the middle of the night feeling strange. I couldn't move. Well, if I could move, I was too scared to move. I remember that. The Christmas tree was gone and in its place stood a ruddy, 
rugged-looking old-timey soldier with his long gun at his side in a military-like position. He was just staring straight ahead. His attire also looked old. Those were my thoughts as an eight-year-old. He didn't move and I also didn't move. The thing is, I don't remember what happened. I don't remember if it went away or if I fell back asleep. But I remember I turned over and my little brother's head was a dog's head in the bed beside me. Like straight up looked exactly like a dog's head. That was the strangest experience of my entire life. I have no idea what happened that night. One thing I do remember, as I have been trying to debunk this in my mind, is that we had been blowing up balloons earlier in the evening for my cousin's party. I could have just blown up too many and got dizzy and it caused me to have weird dreams or something. I don't know. It was so weird. Case file number 1289, written by Sky Penguin 8 Matt. A total stranger knew my password? Back in elementary school, I had an iPod touch. I changed my password the night before school. My brother saw my old password. And by the time I was on the bus to school, I forgot it. Nobody at school could have known the password. When I was talking to the person next to me about the password, the person sitting in front of me didn't know him, just said four numbers, and it worked. It was the password. No clue how he knew. Still amazes me and creeps me out today. Bonus file written by God1643, A Paranormal Pregnancy. I remember being told about this story by my mom when she was teaching me to drive as a way to stress how weird the stretch of road near us is. I'm pretty skeptical of stuff by nature, but she grew up here and she knows it's bad. She heard it from her mother who knew the woman involved, so you're getting this as a third or even fourth hand account, and I'm modifying names of people close to me. Treat that as you will. I have less details on this because it wasn't my own story. I just asked my mom for a recount and she herself doesn't have all that much in terms of detail and I don't feel like waiting on a snail mail for my grandma for the whole thing. There's homes up on that hill. It's a pretty well-to-do area so they aren't shacks, but they aren't mansions either and they aren't large plots of land. So everyone kind of knows everyone. At the end of the street by the church is a little ma and pa shop of baked goods with an apple orchard and then the church and then another main road. The stretch of road mom told me not to drive on is between that ma and pa shop and the first main road. It used to be a dirt road back when this happened, only really used for tractors and the rare grocery run from the people living on the road. It's summer, 1959. My grandmother, G, her mother, M, their friend Anne, and his husband Ronald are all in their car. Ronald is freshly shaven from the barber, as a reason they left, and the barber had a salon next door where the woman spent some social time as Ron did his business there. They drive slowly down the road and honk before every corner. It's a lot of blind corners even now, and it was worse back then. Even I do that on foggy nights now. They get about halfway down, near the right side cut, which leads to another road we'll call F Road. Further down is K Road, where I turn to the left to get to my road and my home now. They turn the corner and see a woman. She's wearing a pale sundress, hanging to her knees, slightly indecent at the time according to mom, has a large sun hat clutched in her hand, another hand on her stomach, a bit of brown something on her legs and is waddling down the road. She is heavily pregnant, as in 7 to 8 months. G tells Ron to pull over and ask if she's alright, but he's already doing it. He pulls in behind the woman and hops out, asking if she's alright. It's as he gets close that he notices it's not mud on her legs, it's blood. When he gets her attention enough to meet her eyes, she's insensate, lulling her neck like a bobblehead and muttering. She sees him and kinda jumps in place like she's startled and falls backwards. Ron can't catch her in time but he asks her if she needs a ride as he picks her up. She says something in return. It sounds vaguely affirmative, so he tells G and Ann to make space in the back bench of the car and sets her in. He turns the car around and makes for the main road in the direction of the church, nearer to where my encounter happened. The hospital is a 15 or 20 minute drive now, probably closer to half an hour back then. My grandma is sitting beside this woman, 
and she turns to face her. The woman has almost crossed her legs, but looks uncomfortable in the position. She is picking at her legs, scraping at the scabs. G tries to tell her not to do that, but she won't listen. As soon as the skin is clear of scabs and a bit of actual mud, cuts begin appearing on her legs. As in appearing, not being revealed from under the scabs, the scabs reveal fresh, healed, lily-white skin, which is immediately covered again in clean, linear lines of blood. The woman begins murmuring, but she doesn't sound pained. It's only when my grandma, in confused horror, reaches out to see if the wounds are really there, that the woman catches her wrist. Don't let him in, you two, she says, and the lines turn to slashes, cutting deeper into the woman's calf. The woman groans and lets go of grandma's hand. He's angry. Don't touch me, he'll get mad. From there, her head lolls back against the headrest and doesn't say another coherent word the whole rest of the ride. G spends the whole time worriedly murmuring with Anne, and whenever G looks forward, Ron is driving too fast and his hands are white knuckled. He's not looking all that good, and as G watches, a slash appears on his skin on the back of his forearm where his shirt is rolled up. They drop the woman off at the hospital and give their story. The doctors look at G and Anne like they're crazy. It's only when Ron shows him their arm that they take it seriously. Sexism, according to G. And Anne snaps at the doctor for being a blind, jug-eared, cotton-stuffed moron. The important thing is a damn woman and her child. We still use that insult jovially in the family, so I know that quote better than the rest. The next Sunday, Ron goes in early to church, arms all bandaged, and collapses about halfway through the sermon. He shakes on the ground for a while. There's a doctor in the crowd who puts him on the side thinking it's a seizure, and Ron vomits up blood before passing out. Apparently, after they rushed him to the hospital, they found out the sly skin had gotten worse, his arms were in bad shape, and it's only when the woman, kept under observation but they were willing to let her walk around, asks to visit his room to thank him, and she talks to them for a while that the cuts stop appearing. G, or her friend Anne for that matter, and Anne, was his wife for 43 years until he died, could never get Ron to tell him what the woman said. But he did say, never miss a day in church. He lost a job to keep those Sundays, and he said, I'd rather die in the church than live outside. I always thought that last bit was weird, but now I'm thinking, what if it wasn't just religious fervor, but he genuinely believed he was actually safer in that church? Case fall number 1290, written by Mythicon Rainbow, my father Tracy, the Lord of Rain. This happened in 2008. Shortly after my 17th birthday, my dad and I were best friends. We supported each other through a lot, and we just emotionally understood each other. He used to tell me, I can read your face and body language like a book. You can't hide secrets from me. And he was right. He always knew when I was upset, even if I put on my best thespian act. We used to talk about everything, from science to religion. He was a devout Christian. I told him one day, when you get to heaven, you'll have to let me know if it's there or not. He laughed and said he'd make it rain in Tucson for a straight week. A week after my 17th birthday, he suffered a massive heart attack and passed away. I still tear up over a decade later. I miss him so much. The night before he passed away, my brother, father and I piled into the car to go see a Friday night movie. My dad had tossed me the keys to practice my driving more. So I obliged and pulled out of the driveway and made my way towards the stop sign, exiting our neighborhood. At the stop sign, he said, You know what? I'm not feeling very well. Can you take me home and you two can go see the movie? To this day, I can't rationalize why I said these words. Do you want me to take you to the hospital? He said no. And turning the car around when the pit of my stomach knew something was wrong is one of my biggest regrets. As he walked inside, I called out, Drink some water! I love you! So, at the least, I keep in my heart the last words we ever said to each other was that we loved each other. He passed away 12 hours later. He had been feeling the start of the attack. The story continues. The next night, after we spent all day in the hospital with his body, stroking his hair and telling him we loved him and such, 
we were all emotionally drained. My mother, parents were divorced, drove from California that day to Arizona to be with us and got a hotel room. My brother and mother had fallen asleep. I could hear their rhythmic breathing. I was sharing a bed with my mom and there was maybe a foot gap between the hotel bed and the wall that separated me from the bathroom. I was replaying the events of the last 24 hours over and over in my head. What could I have done differently? How did I know something was wrong? Why didn't I just drive him to the hospital like my gut told me to? As I asked myself these questions, the room suddenly filled up. All available floor space was taken by a person standing, but they were all black shadows, no features. I wasn't afraid of them though, they felt familiar. Then I smelled it, his Sunday church cologne only used to approach God's house. Now I'm not religious like he was, but I respected his religious beliefs. Then I felt the warmth in that little foot space between me and the wall. I looked over and I saw another outline, but this one was red. I'll never forget that red, it was the purest red I've ever seen. It smelled like him, it felt like him, it was familiar. So I whispered as to not wake my mother and brother. I love you too dad, I'll be okay. Go with them. I felt what felt like a forehead kiss, and then the room was empty again, just as quickly as it filled. Whole event lasted a few seconds. For the rest of the week, it rained in Tucson for a solid week. But the story still doesn't end there. Fast forward to his funeral. Now I want to give a quick history lesson as this is important. In ancient Greece, when someone died, they would place coins on the deceased eyelids to pay for their transport across the river Styx. My father and I had many conversations about Greek mythology, and now I'm a Hellenic pagan. Service is over. We placed his ashes in the ground and buried them in the cemetery. Then the family sat in a circle and shared their favorite memories of him. My uncle gave a wacky childhood story. My step-sibling said how they had both recently found two stacked pennies in weird locations right in front of them. Like my stepsis worked at a vet's office as a receptionist and she looked away and looked back and they were just there. I admit I was jealous at the time. I talked about the thing I had already missed. The jingle of his keys that he hung on one of his belt loops. Every day he came home from work, I heard his keys first and would get up and greet him with a hug and ask about his day and tell him about school. Sometimes he'd help with homework or we'd make dinner together. When everyone was packing up, I laid on the ground next to his temporary tombstone and just, I don't know, pondered on life and death, memories of my dad. Mostly, what I think I was doing was feeling pain and letting it seep into the ground. Finally, my brother came over to me, gently rubbed my back and said it was time to go. He left me to collect myself, and as I started to push myself up, I looked down and right under where my head had been, there were two stacked pennies. They weren't there when I laid down, so I left them there, next to his tombstone, just in case he needed them. There are more stories. My father has continued to visit me every so often, mostly in the middle of the night. It wakes me up by starting with his cologne. I do not buy it, keep it near me, nor have anything with the scent. I don't because it hurts and reminds me too much of him. Then a corner of the room darkens and I feel like I'm not alone. Sometimes it's scary and unsettling until I smell it. Then I talk to him, tell him what's going on. Then the darkness suddenly will dissipate and the smell will vanish and I'll feel alone again. A lot of this is unexplained, especially if you don't believe in the afterlife. A lot of it scared me for a long time and I still can't explain the question I asked him. I can't explain his cologne coming and going within minutes in the middle of the night and I can't explain the pennies and how they got there so quickly. And yeah, this is the story of my dad, Tracy, the man who made it rain for an entire week in Tucson in 2008. Case file number 1291 written by Printmaker, the $1.99 burrito that defied the laws of physics. About 10 years ago, I took a job in Bolivia and had to get some vaccinations for my visa requirements. Like many Americans, I had no insurance and was going to a MedPlus clinic that is attached to some select locations of a major grocery store chain where I live. 
I called ahead and drove an hour to one, only to arrive and find that I was misinformed and they were out of the vaccine. They sent me to another store about 30 minutes further away that they assured me had the one they were holding for me. I got to the next destination and again, they were out and referred me to another store yet another 40 minutes further away. Frustrated and hungry, I walk over to the little food and deli area and get a chicken tender lunch with mashed potatoes and corn. They put the food in white clamshell box, print the barcode sticker out, and tape it over the closed lid on the to-go box, grab some plasticware and reach out to hand it to me, and I decide last minute to also add one of those deep fried burritos that are orange from all their greasy fried goodness. I watch the person peel back the label to open the box grab the burrito in a little paper sleeve and put the burrito into the to-go box and print the additional label for the burrito, which they again slapped over the seam to seal the lid back. This happened in plain view to me as I'm hungrily eyeballing all the movements of this food. I was the only person in line and they were the only person behind the counter. Now this is where things get weird. They had partially covered the old label with the new one and when I walked over to the register, they only scanned one and it rang up as just the price of the burrito. I had one of those gut feelings that happens rarely in life where you can actually feel the wheels of reality turning. It was palpable. I was very aware that the price was wrong and I viscerally felt like my moral compass was being tested and I chose to let it ride and only paid the $1.99 instead of what should have been about $12 because after all, this grocery chain had already wasted about 2 hours of my time and who really cares about $10 so why not? Thing is, it just felt wrong. I can't explain it any more than that. I get in the car and head to my next destination to finally, hopefully, get my shots and be done with it. About 20 minutes down the road, I'm stuck in stop and go traffic, so I peel back the label and crank the box open to grab the burrito because I can eat it safely while driving and it's not there. Which doesn't compute at all because it has to be there. I checked again. Definitely don't see it. I paw around in the tenders, I stick my fingers in the mashed potatoes to make sure that it's not somehow hiding under them even though that's not really possible. I pull off on the side of the road, I look on the floor under the seat. I open the box flat on the seat like a book and proceed to shuffle the entire contents of tenders, corn and mashed potatoes from one side to the other. There's no burrito. I called the deli counter. She remembers me and vaguely recalls what I ordered and assures me that nothing was left behind. Mostly, she is confused more than anything as to why I'm asking if somehow she didn't put it in the box or if they found a burrito laying around somewhere because it escaped. It was just gone. So basically, I just sat there on the side of the road, hands covered in mashed potatoes, eating my chicken tenders, musing over the nature of reality, trying to reconcile the two divergent empirical truths I was experiencing. Just sat in total silence for about 10 minutes. Then I wiped off my hands, buckled up again, and drove on. Case Fall number 1292, written by Social Dropout. The perfect row of dominoes that saved our lives. It's like the universe aligned to keep me safe. I was living with my recent ex and his best friend. Bad time in my life. They went out clubbing to a town a good 10 to 15 miles away. They came back in the morning with a random stranger they met and an exotic worker. They slept on the sofa that night and I woke up to that random stranger, male, poking his head around the door and saying hello to me. He told me where he lived, which was a fair drive away, how he got to my house and what they were doing upstairs and asked if he could get some water and borrow a cigarette. We ended up sitting outside talking. Like I said, crazy messed up time in my life. He started telling me how pretty I was and he couldn't believe what my ex was doing and how great he'd treat me if I was his girlfriend. At one point he attempted to cut I love my name into his chest with a knife and told me he was going to buy the house next door because he could. Pretty sure he wasn't sober at the time. A friend came and picked him up a couple of hours later. Fast forward 6 to 8 months. I was now homeless and sofa surfing. It was around 1am. Me and a friend I was sofa surfing with decided to make the short walk to the 24 hours to get some cigarettes. Halfway there, we ran into a gang of lads, about 10 to 12 of them. 
and they started pulling me and my friend away from each other. My heart's racing remembering this. They did not have good intentions for us. My friend started screaming for me, and then I saw him? The stranger from my house from months ago. He noticed me and told them to stop and leave us alone. They did. He was part of the group. I don't know how. My guess is he was related or knew someone from there. We ended up making it through that morning safe, and I've never seen him again. I don't know what might have happened to us if I hadn't met him that morning at my house, or if my ex met someone different and brought them home. If I didn't have any cigarettes to lend him that got us talking. If he decided to stay home that day. If any small thing was different that day, me and my friend at the worst may not have been here today and, at the least, be traumatized from what they planned to do to us. I felt like the most unluckiest girl, but also lucky and alive. Okay, so it's file 1263. Peter Weller's Roman Rescue. Peter Weller is a phenomenal actor. Lucky that you got to meet him, even if it was under such bizarre circumstances. I can chalk this up to a very, very, very unlikely coincidence. Unless a guardian angel force was involved? To be fair, I don't think these three guys would have seriously harmed you. Perhaps just fueled by an anti-American sentiment, as some people in foreign countries do have. So the guardian angel just intervened to forge you away from them. But again, I don't think anything serious, I don't think they would have killed you or anything like that. But it is obviously unsettling. It's not right, don't do that to people. Treat people with kindness and it'll be repaid most of the time. And you know, doing that even when you have reason to be angry at someone, that takes a special kind of character. And man, it's powerful. Quesantre 1264. A soldier's miracle in the midst of chaos. So first off, you're not pathetic. Whatever the doctor might have thought or not, I doubt he even thought that. You're a warrior who went through a kind of hell mixed with fear and adrenaline that no one outside of your unit could even comprehend. Words and the images in my mind that attempt to convey what you went through can never do it justice. Secondly, this could be a quantum immortality event for sure, as death from gangrene is a very real and very serious concern. Indeed, it rarely heals on its own. So quantum immortality might be the most likely explanation, but then it's only partial. Because if you were in a new universe, one where you did have gangrene, I mean the doctor in that new universe, if it is a new universe, we, you went back to him and he was surprised the gangrene healed himself. So in that new universe, you still healed yourself, even if you died in your original. So maybe your body in the new universe, or maybe just in general, you never switch. Maybe it isn't quantum immortality, and you simply healed yourself through a kind of genetic mutation. Makes you think about the X-Men franchise, right? And while the majority of the mutations displayed in that comic series or the movies are physically impossible, they break the laws of physics, some aren't. For instance, Logan's regenerative abilities exceed what is physically possible because you need new mass to actually heal, even if your cells could divide fast enough and infinitely. For him to heal that quickly, he'd have to physically be in, you know, eating constantly, basically, to heal. Maybe then, but even then it's probably not physically possible, at least if you have the mass, maybe. But the idea that some humans out there have superhuman ability to recover from illnesses and regenerate injuries isn't inconceivable at all. You may have one of these hyper-rare genetic mutations that grants this ability. I wouldn't go around testing it, but hey, if you have it, that's great. <laughs> when you need it, and like in this case, comes in handy. Case notes for the creepy file number 1113, The Christmas Spirits. So was your grandma infusing the atmosphere with her own spiritual energy so you'd stay awake long enough to get the sign? Might be a stretch there, but it's a very wholesome stretch that I'd like to run with. Too great a coincidence otherwise. The exact time, obviously AM to PM, but still. Also, I have seen a few funny videos where pets and other animals push doorbells at night outside, caught on ring cameras. If not for the timing in this story, I'd have gone with that explanation, but again, some coincidences can't be brushed off freely. And now time for the fact of the day. Henrietta Lacks, born Loretta Pleasant, August 1st, 1920 all the way to October 4th, 1951, was an African-American woman whose cancer cells are the source of the Hela cell line, the first immortalized human cell line, and one of the most important cell lines in medical research. An immortalized cell line reproduces indefinitely under certain specific conditions, and the Hela cell line continues to be a source of invaluable medical data to the present day. Lax was the unwitting source of these cells from a tumor biopsied during treatment for cervical cancer at John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland in 1951. These cells, when cultured by George Otto Gay, 
who created the cell line known as HeLa, which is still used for medical research, as was in the practice, no consent was required to culture these cells obtained from lax treatment. Neither she nor her family were compensated for the extraction or use of the HeLa cell lines, which is ridiculous. The amount of value that they've gained, I mean, they should, the family especially. Even though some information about the origin of HeLa's immortal cell lines was known to researchers after 1970, the Lax family was not made aware of the cell line's existence until 1975. With knowledge of the cell line's genetic provenance becoming public, its use for medical research and for commercial purposes continues to raise concerns about privacy and patient rights. Those are extended beyond what they were back in the day, but still, it's something to be concerned about. I mean, in a certain sense, cancer is like this, but this extends beyond it. I think no matter what happens to the cell, barring you know being burned or something, extreme like that, it will survive and reproduce. An immortal cell line. If Henrietta had this, and it didn't turn into cancer, it was simply her normal cells functioning as intended, but being able to infinitely re um, divide, and the telomeres never being damaged, she could potentially have lived forever. Maybe eventually one day, someone will actually have a genetic mutation where the cells function that way, and metabolic damage doesn't accumulate. They will be the first true immortal. Case notes for file 1265. Lost keys reappear 18 months later in an unbelievable place. So it's an homage to a weird universe indeed. Yep, truth in that. There is no explaining events like this away. Not with the hand wave that most use. You know, the type like, oh, it's no big deal. The keys just bounced 50 miles into her desk. <laughs> Makes sense. No, no, it doesn't. Sometimes I wonder what it will take to convince people. But then I think, maybe most people don't want to be convinced that there's more going on than immediately meets the eye. It's too terrifying. Case also the creepy file number 114. The chilling conspiracy in my military school. That last line? What the hell? Reminds me of the 1984 paragraphs involving Winston and O'Brien. Locking eyes that look, knowing Winston was different. Just going along with the flow and pretending, but... His mind was not fully absorbed into the propaganda. He couldn't hold two opposing views simultaneously. They were in conflict, and they would always be at war. Now, I don't know if this military school was truly trying to brainwash anyone. That'd be hard to accept, wouldn't it? And yet, strangely not unbelievable either. Maybe it wasn't trying to brainwash. Maybe it was a test to see who could be brainwashed and who couldn't. And you proved that you weren't susceptible to that kind of subliminal messaging. Most people are, but some people aren't. You know, a small portion cannot be hypnotized, for instance. Okay, so it's for the bonus file. Gamers vs. Shadow. I've seen brief, unexplained glimpses in my periphery too while gaming, or just like watching a movie. I always attributed to my mind conjuring them based on whatever game I was playing or what I was watching. Shadows of the subconscious. Maybe that is all they were in my case, but for you, your nephew is undeniable evidence. The younger a child is, past pure toddlerhood, the more they can discern between the veil of the mortal plane and beyond it. If a spirit was lingering behind, angry, bitter, violent, he'd have known. The only silver lining in these cases are that spirits can rarely harm us, though put on a bombastic display of power, moving objects around, but I can count on one hand how many stories I've read where someone was actively injured directly from a spirit. I don't know if anyone was ever even killed by one. So not impossible. But clear there's some kind of protection in place that makes it very challenging for a spirit, angry or not, to do us harm. Still, that said, why take the risk, right? Getting out of dangerous situations is always the best call. Plus, you know, you just don't want to live in an area where something doesn't want you there. It's unsettling. And now time for the quote of the day, from 1984. Perhaps one did not want to be loved so much as to be understood. Maybe that is Love, or at least part of love, is truly understanding someone else. Because there's always a separation between minds. I can't, you, you can't Vulcan mind melt with someone else, right? You can't truly know what they're thinking. But if you, if someone knows who they are, and then someone else truly understands them, that is a connection, a bond that is that goes beyond any words or actions. To truly know who someone is, there's a tremendous power in that. And while that, I wouldn't say that's all love is. It is a strong component of it, to truly understand each other. Okay, so let's file 1266. My 600 mile per hour road trip. Another dose of fog, another dose of glitch. Coincidence? Nope. The fog is a sign of a distortion. Like Neo 
seeing the black cat walk by twice. In the simulation we live in, it's not a déjà vu that does it, or at least not the only sign. And no, fog doesn't always mean there's a disturbance in the code. It's a natural weather phenomenon. But its association with so many glitches can't be ignored, in my opinion. You were in kind of a dead pocket of space-time, is my guess. Still driving, the road manifested beneath the tires, the car engine functioning, using gas, but that information was only relayed to the true universe when you exited the fog, the lurch that you felt. Until then, nothing was truly processing. It only became reality when you exited the dead space. Case notes for the bonus file. The Christmas Guardian. While I am no psychologist or therapist, I strongly agree with the suggestion of giving yourself a year, uh, assigning yourself goals, challenges even, to conquer and surmount. As human beings, we thrive against adversity. Reminds me of the line from the Matrix movie where Agent Smith is talking to Morpheus, explaining how the original Matrix was supposed to be a pure paradise. Or was this the architect talking to Neo? Well, one of those. It was supposed to be a Garden of Eden with no difficulties, pure bliss, no pain, no struggle. Yet the human mind revolted against this. And yes, this is just a movie, but I think if there really was a simulation like this, the human mind wouldn't cope well in pure bliss like that. We need weights to bear, mountains to climb, oceans to explore. In my opinion, depression is usually rooted in a lack of purpose. Well, it sounds like you found yours in your family, and that's beautiful. Now, as for the Christmas event itself, it had to be an induced hallucination, probably from your guardian angel. It can't just be a spirit, because you ate physical food, and I don't think spirits can conjure that up from the ether, or spirits actively running a grill and cooking you a burger. That'd be a neat trick. Wouldn't mind having one of those around. <laughs> and now time for the quote of the day. Nothing gives one person so much advantage over another as to remain always cool and unruffled under all circumstances. Thomas Jefferson Another founding father, very respectable, and with a lot of wisdom, and a lot of courage. And I think that's what this, this really re represents. No one is cool and calm always internally, but it's the external manifestation that becomes reality. So if you're struggling inside, nervous, anxious, and you let those emotions unravel out into the world, then it ripples out and affects everyone else. But if you contain them, at least during the event, maybe deal with it after, but during the event, being stoic and calm and collected, even in an emergency, there's so much value in that, and indeed it gives you a tremendous advantage. And not just an advantage like over other people, but to help people. If you're cool and calm and collected, you can help people. You can still think clearly. That's a power right there. Case file number 1267. Navigating the time bends on the I-5. Alright, so this time, no fog was involved in this time skip, even though it was driving related too, which makes it more likely that aliens are involved. The only way to confirm would be looking at your gas tank meter before and after. It dropped notably from 50 plus miles of travel. If it didn't, then you'd know some kind of advanced craft moved you and your car forward. But it could also be a space-time portal. If it is aliens though, I wonder, do they conduct experiments on our technology too? Wonder if aliens care at all about our mechanical hardware. Kind of like how we'd study the spears and huts of indigenous tribes as a curiosity, and maybe to glean more about their culture. Maybe it's not just directly us that they care to analyze, but our stuff too. You learn a lot about people by what they build and what they care about. Okay, so file 1268. One act of kindness can ripple through time. A test. A repeat of the Lady of the Lake mythos. It washes into many instances of our life. I don't know if this test produced some reward for you in the future, but then that isn't meant to be known. Because we aren't supposed to be good to each other for something, but to be good for each other in of itself is a reward. Because if we all act that way, then the world becomes an amazing place to live in. Can you think of a better reward than that? I can't. If everyone acted to help each other, and to be honest and kind, and that'd be a beautiful place. There's always those rotten apples that take advantage of that. It does become hard, but basically, to have the best life you can, the best society, you have to have high trust. High trust societies, you know, like in Japan, they have shops where there's no one that attends it. They just have prices and a basket to put money in, and people just pay out of uh, the honor system. I mean, maybe there's some places you can do that in the US, but I guess they'd be more rural. Something about a large congregation of people, like in cities, 
in most cities, it's it doesn't work well with humans. They they the the trust factor drops so much, and I guess there's just so many chances of someone being a rotten character that you guard yourself against that. It's a shame. Case notes for the creepy file number one hundred and fifteen: the bone chilling bathroom screen. My first instinct is thinking about banshees, but these are meant to appear when death claimed a soul recently, usually within the family circle. But then consider that note. This is a mobile home, elevated on platforms presumably surrounded by woods of South Carolina. So could it have been the mating call of an animal that had snuck under the bathroom floor and after releasing the screech, scurried off back into the woods? Hmm, I guess that's probably the most uh, likely explanation. Apparently foxes and some other animals make a really weird female screaming sound as a mating call. The wild is very weird. And now time for the quote of the day. Be who you are and say what you feel. Because those who mind don't matter. And those who matter don't mind. Dr. Seuss. Yeah, be yourself. Your odd, quirky version of sentience. And if other people don't like it, well, they don't matter anyways. Why do you care about their opinion? Now, if it's family or friends, maybe you listen, but not through judgment, just critique. You know, people have interventions and stuff for really bad things that are going on. But generally speaking, if you're a bit odd, that's okay. Like for me, I am a night owl. I literally sleep at like 6 or 7 a.m. all the time, just by default, not because I have to get up for work or anything. Most people think that's weird. Okay. I have uh, light sensitivity, so I can't be... I'm basically a vampire. I made a joke about that before, but yeah. I'm basically a vampire who doesn't have to feed on humans, so that part, the last part, is pretty good and important to note, so any hunters out there, you can uh, go hunt something else. Short of being an actual monster, be yourself. Those who mind don't matter, and those who matter don't mind. Okay, so on file 1269. The Mysterious Woman of Destiny. That's it. Maybe that's what an angel is. Not purely guardians. More than that. Actively pushing back, fighting against the darkness and evil with the world, not through sword and spear of destiny, no, but by attuning our own energy to the straight and narrow, paying it forward. This is the key. Converting us humans into warriors, but not through fighting, but just by being good people, better people. It's something I love to consider doing one day if I ever can. I think about Mr. Beast often, how much he helps people. It's amazing. The only thing I'd change is asking people to pay that same generosity back to someone in their life who's in need. Now, obviously, most people couldn't pay it back in the same way, you know, just giving out houses and stuff. You can't really do that, even if you have a house gifted to you, but you can still pay it forward in smaller chunks. I think many people probably do that receive generosity without even being reminded, but that little note of request can tip the scales in the holistic macro level sense. We can be our own angels. That's a beautiful thought. Case file number 1270. How a chance meeting pulled me back from the edge. This is one of the stories that after reading, you just have to sit back, take a breath, and simply let it infiltrate your soul. You have to let it in, in every aspect. At first, I was considering the possibility that this was an everyday, true and proper human being who just happened to have the ability to read people's emotions. Empaths, they're called. But this goes beyond that. If it was a flesh and blood human, he had abilities beyond high empathy. He knew what your plan was specifically. Now, while I do believe such humans exist, I think the coincidence of that accident occurring on the freeway, which diverted you away, points towards this being a guardian angel event. In fact, my gut says that accident was fictitious, or maybe a low-level event where no one was actually harmed, but enough to cause traffic. I wonder if you saw the accident yourself, or if you heard about it on your phone or radio. If it even happened is a question in my mind. Your guardian needed you off the road and in a place he could appear to manifest that wouldn't freak you out. I mean, think about it. If he just appeared in your car right next to you <laughs> while driving, well, maybe you would have swerved and killed yourself accidentally in that case. That's not what he wanted. And even if you didn't, even if you heeded his advice, you may think you're nuts. And what happens to your family? Which is where this swirls back to. If you have people who love you, depend on you, then ending the journey, in my opinion, is just wrong. We all have autonomy over our own bodies. But if we choose to forge close bonds with others, then we kind of infuse our body and soul into them, at least small portions of it. What we do with our body then affects them too, so always consider that. And don't think of it as an anchor. 
Think of it as a light to persevere against the darkness and challenges of the world. People you love and care about, they're not trapping you on this mortal plane, they're making it worth living. Okay, so for the bonus file. Somehow, I knew exactly where my dog was trapped. The sixth sense, but really it's beyond just a sense, isn't it? It's knowledge woven into your soul. Or maybe drawn in is the better expression. You listen to your gut, the tickle in your belly as you call it, I like that. Even though there was absolutely no evidence in the material world to direct you to that specific area, you literally already searched it thoroughly, as you say. It wasn't a gamble or a dice roll. You knew it. Your soul connected to a loved one, and yes, pets certainly fall under that category. Fed as much knowledge to your subconscious as it could to lead you where you needed to be. It was just a feeling, but you knew. Just horrible to consider, though, the suffering, having to survive on mud for six days. Thank God you found her. And now time for the quote of the day. The greatest pleasure in life is doing what people say you cannot do. Walter Baghot. So what is this quote referring to? Is it doing things you aren't supposed to be doing? Or is it doing things that people think you can't do? I think it's the latter. If someone or a lot of people believe that you can't do something and you prove them wrong, there's a almost a carnal pleasure in that of defiance and just saying, told you so, I can do it, you didn't believe in me. It's also a way to weed out people that really don't belong in your life anyways. If you're a friend, a good friend will give advice and critique. If someone has a plan, uh, one of their friends has a plan, and they it's kind of crazy, well, I don't think you should talk them out of it. You should give them your opinion and advice, kind of like a co-pilot. Get a lay of the land. If there's a storm ahead, tell them about it, the challenges they may face. But, but if they decide to go and attempt it, then support them. Don't put them down because it's something that seems crazy to you. Maybe it is. Maybe they'll fail. Probably most of the time they will. That's just how life goes. But you have to be there to support them. It's a tough line to balance, but I think, I think enough people get it right. But it's something to consider, you know. If you have a friend trying to do something, you know, launching a business or going on a trip or something, unless it's absolutely crazy, like going on vacation in Sudan or something, you know, maybe then talk them out of it. But generally speaking, be there and support your friends. That's what a good friend is. Case notes for file 1271, The Coconut of Time. Every now and again, I read a story such as this one that just blows my mind. There are so many novel anomalies in this. Of course, like smelling the coconut. I'm just sitting here at the loss, you know, what does that mean? You both smelled the coconut as evidence from him asking you later in the day. You never mentioned it first. What does that mean? Aliens never produce a coconut smell, to my knowledge. I tried looking that up and no, it's not a common aspect of time loss or any anomaly. Coconut is just coconut. Also, your dog acting scared is a very important detail. It means something did happen in a way to affect her too. Maybe you both disappeared from the apartment and then reappeared and she simply missed you. But it sounds even more than that. The abrupt event affected her too. If she could talk and relay her experience, it may have been just as sliced as yours. But then being dressed in pajamas but one kid not being. Hell, this experience is so all over the place, all I can think of is an extremely powerful trickster warping reality in 20 different directions that don't connect just to mess with you. What else could it be? Okay, so for the bonus file. The mystery of the wet-haired apparition. So nothing being missing, and you saw a woman, not a man, one that was wet from the shower, leads me to think it is very unlikely to be an actual intruder. That said, your roommate was very smart to contact the police and have the place checked out thoroughly. You never know, better safe than sorry. The answer to the mystery is repeating signals, repeating patterns, if a soul disconnects from the host body, or rather splits in two, with half staying behind, the other half does what it knows, which he's already done a million times before, is to shower in her apartment. These soul severance events aren't going to produce a soul wandering around curing cancer or anything novel like that. I don't think that's how it works. More interesting a question in my mind than what happened seems clear enough is why. The catalyst is what gnaws at me. She was with her boyfriend, presumably having a good time, so why would her soul split temporarily then? Is it a certain mindset required of being relaxed and happy? I don't think it's that. Is it something forcing the split? And now time for the question of the day. Is there a time where you did something that seems so out of character that most people wouldn't believe it? For me, it was the last day in high school. I only did one year, not even a full year, and the last day when I was checking out, I started a food fight. 
in the cafeteria area. <laughs> Maybe it does seem like me. I am kind of a trickster, but no one else in school would have believed it. And I don't think anyone found out. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> so much wasted food. Should have ate it. Okay, so it's file 1272. The Guardian Angel on Four Legs. The good boy Guardian Angel. <laughs> I could see that. Sounds like a protective act that Mr. Ben would engage in as well. He always bangs his head on the wall, but he always knows the best time to ask for food as well, so smart and dumb. <laughs> in this case, was the Guardian Angel embodied in the dog? A type of angelic spirit that possessed the dog? Or maybe rather directed the dog still in free will towards you somehow? I'm not sure. I suppose it's unknowable. But what is knowable is that you do have someone looking out for you. Now keep in mind, this doesn't mean you can never be harmed. But it does mean that we aren't as defenseless as it can often feel like. Not as alone. That's a comforting thought. Okay, so let's file 1273. Maybe I'm already dead? There is real trouble in communication from the other side. I don't think you die and then pop into a temporary ethereal plane of existence sitting at a computer or with a phone. Your father had to figure out a way to message you, and maybe it was with automated phone prompts that he could cobble together, which is why it sounded a bit off. But just enough like him to make you wonder, to give you that kind of sign. I'm still of the opinion that your father's soul is lingering behind. It is but a mere fragment of it, a small chunk that isn't sentient as you and I are, because the bulk of the soul makes a transit over to a new universe where he never died. Over there he showed leukemia who's the real boss. If that's the case, the simple soul morsel of your father accomplished his task, letting you know there's more going on than meets the eye. Death isn't the finality most think it is. If that's all he wanted, I think his energy dissipated away fully in that moment, and now he only exists as a full soul in that other universe. In fact, maybe the soul fragments that linger behind don't dissipate, but instead reunite with the full soul in the quantum and vitality spectrum, back in the other universe but only after their purpose here is completed. So soul vanishes from our universe, but they don't dissipate. I like that idea. And now time for the question of the day. If one wish of yours could come true, what would it be? So speaking purely as a selfish wish, not curing cancer or noble causes like that, I'd have to go with the ability to fly. The travel opportunities would be beyond comprehension. That said, I'd have to bundle up because it gets kind of cold up there. Unless I travel slowly, I'd also have to have a whole getup, you know, like goggles and everything, because when you travel fast, the wind makes it so you can't even breathe. I remember skydiving and going at 120 miles an hour towards the planet. You can't breathe at all. It's uh, kind of terrifying. So there's that to keep in mind. But yeah, the ability to just pick up, fly wherever I wanted to. No need for a driver's license then or an e-bike. They can't go fast enough. I mean, you got super strength and all those things, but I think I'd just go with flying. Just take a vacation overseas. Gotta stay low to avoid the radar, though, as Iron Man found out. Okay, so let's 1274. The Whiskered Guardian Angel. So a couple instances this week of guardian angels either possessing or taking the form of animals to ward off potential dangers? Here's a question to ponder on. Do guardian angels have access to future buffered knowledge? So do they know what would happen if they don't intervene, or do they just have to wing it? Eh? See what I did there? <laughs> No, but really, maybe they don't have foresight. Maybe they just have to judge situations case by case and use their best judgment. And also use whatever is available in the area. No other humans to possess, so an animal will have to do in a pinch. And if you've ever been on the receiving end of a cat gone wild, let me tell you, I'd rather fight a human. Cats have built-in weapons. Okay, so it's for the creepy file number 116. Cab Driver's Dark Link. Ah yes, blending in as a cab driver is not too uncommon a strategy for serial killers and other nefarious folk. No one thinks about the cab driver, or I guess Uber drivers these days. And now I'm thinking about the BBC Sherlock show, the first episode, where Sherlock is led into the cab because that's the, the villain of the, the first act. At least you weren't involved in some daring game of Russian pills where you have to guess which one is poison and which one isn't, and he always wins. Don't like that. What concerns me is how adept some are lying, though. Deception, blending in as normal people when under the mask. They're human monsters, but only inside. Always be on the lookout for signs. It's typical of serial killers to enjoy discussing their own crimes, their own cases. It gives them a sense of primal power, as much as the act itself. And be advised that the more charming someone is, it's not necessarily that the more charming they are, the more likely they are a serial killer, but it does play in very well for it, because if someone is charming and 
very attractive with the halo effect, you lower your guard. So don't lower your guard, especially with someone you don't know. I mean, after months of knowing someone, sure, but not at first glance. You know, if you meet someone attractive, don't just get into their car because <laughs> they're attractive. You don't want to end up in a bathtub full of ice or in, you know, six feet below the ground. Okay, so it's for the bonus file. Spine tingling footsteps in the night. Squatters living in the walls? Yeah, that always creeped me out as a possibility. But examining the evidence you listed, old bottles, old photos of children in school clothes, doesn't sound like the items that homeless, disheveled people down on their luck or worse would be bringing into a home, especially the pictures. But then the doorknob shaking suggests it was flesh and blood human, or at least a corporeal being, not a spirit. A monster hiding in the walls would be even worse, but honestly, it could be anything. Whatever it was, though, it sounds like it fled after that night. But I'd never be able to sleep in there again, would you? Especially because everything is locked. So if someone was inside and fled, they had to manage to lock it from the outside, so they had to have a key as well. And now time for the quote of the day. The fact that a great many people believe something is no guarantee of its truth. W. Somerset, Moghem. So you have the classic example of Einstein saying to a group of scientists, a hundred scientists, why a hundred? If I'm wrong, one would suffice. And so, if a lot of people believe something, maybe the odds are placed higher on it being correct, but maybe not by as much as most think. Common knowledge or common wisdom, what is accepted by everyone, may not necessarily be true. It doesn't mean it's false too, so don't don't go into the other side where any knowledge that is widely believed is wrong. No. It's just that it may be wrong and you shouldn't be against questioning things just because a lot of people believe them. That's what I would say. So always have an open mind and try to examine facts as objectively as possible. Not an easy thing to do. Case notes are filed 1275. The Midnight Double. I was thinking this would be a classic soul travel episode. But the lack of him on camera is wild and inexplicable. Souls appear on camera like anything else. They're not vampires immune to mirrors or reflections. So what on earth could this be? A doppelganger doesn't seem right. Those evoke strong emotions of fear, even dread, in those near them. I also read further in the comments that the knee compressor was gone. Your husband remembers having it all night and never coming home to get it. This has all the signs of being in a new universe. But why would you and your child have jumped over? But then again, random death and all that does happen. Just recently, I saw a video of a residential home literally blowing up entirely. Not sure what the reason was for it, but stuff like that can happen. Perhaps on a similar note, this happened to you and now you're in a different universe. It would explain everything, but it's very rare, of course. Case okay, so notes for the creepy file number 117. The day the school genius vanished. So a boy genius who hacked into the FBI mainframe and got on the radar? They most likely recruited him. This happens far more often than you might imagine or think. Even outright criminals get brought in if the agency thinks they can extract enough value out of them. Weighted against the crime in question, but in this case, I guess especially him being young, they can let it go and slide and just say, well, he's going to grow up to be an incredible asset. And of course, his parents would go into witness protection. Something along those lines, I would guess. That kid has an interesting future ahead of him. <laughs> Okay, so for the bonus file. When fearful screams echo through the halls. So yes, it's true there's a common tactic of robbers in hotels, even at people's primary residences, to have a woman in distress bang on the door, cry out for help, so you'll lower your guard and open it up for them. Easier than breaking the door down or lockpicking it, if they can even do so. Most people are not the lockpicking lawyer, so you get this kind of strategy instead. That said, while this could be the case here, Something about the description of the scream being so guttural suggests to me a more supernatural force, especially since management didn't know what you were talking about. Surely they would have heard it too. Although, because there's no one else in the hotel, pretty much as you described, no one else heard it, but they would, because they're, they worked there. And in that case, why not call the cops? I mean, there are still cops in Tanzania, I'm pretty sure, right? So my guess is, this happened to other people who stayed in that hotel before, and they don't want to bring light to it because it's not something you'd want to bring attention to. I mean, I doubt Haunted Hotel has a positive tourist factor. <laughs> Maybe for us in the US, but not everywhere. <laughs> and now time for the quote of the day. Be not afraid of growing slowly. Be afraid only of standing still. Chinese proverb.
Yeah, it's the adage of if you're not moving forward, adapting, changing, improving, then you're actually sliding behind because the world is moving in its own right and everyone is progressing. So if you're stagnant, you're left behind. So yeah, you don't have to rush it, but always think of ways you could be improving your life. Make progress. Life is a video game in so many ways. Yeah, you don't have numbers above your head or a, a character screen with all the skills leveled to certain, you know, denominations so you can know, oh, I'm at 99 woodcutting or something like that. I would love if that was the case, but sadly, everything is hidden and it's all just up here. And so even if you're high level, you may prevent yourself from acting on that because of your own mindset. Believe in yourself and try to make some progress. Don't have to rush it. Just some. Okay, so that's file 1276. Unexplained Dome of Light in the Vermont Wilderness So wind is caused by thermal delta. Hot and cold air occupy different pressures. Hot air rises, as we all know. Wind rushing in to fill a vacuum of hot air that rose up in your general area, near the light. It could also be an explosive force that's not exactly wind, it's more of a pressure wave. But I don't think this was an explosion, since that would easily have been heard from nearby, and given how far the light was, not that far, if it was an explosion, you wouldn't have 25 mile per hour gusts of wind. You'd have a pressure wave that would knock you back, break glass, all that kind of stuff. Maybe a kind of experimental thermal testing zone? But the locals at the gas station had never seen it, which makes it less likely. I saw a suggestion that this could be a meteor burning up, but I don't think so. It wouldn't be a static spot of light in the sky, it'd be moving. The glow from the meteor burning up would also fluctuate and is more orange and white than the kind of red you described. There'd also be a huge boom sound when it eventually crashed or burned up. Like I said, a pressure wave. These larger meteors literally explode apart in the air. There's one such instance fairly recently, a few years ago, in Russia. It can shatter windows from miles away. Another idea being kind of a controlled burn, maybe chemicals? The Ohio train derailment comes to mind. Some chemicals do burn bright red and maybe flash very white before burning out completely. Hmm. Okay, so file 1277. The mysterious light pursues teens in the dark. You don't mention the color, but if I had to guess, ball lightning is the most natural explanation for this, usually blue, but not always, and it's unclear what the various colors indicate. I doubt it's as simple as indicating the moral alignment of the spirit, you know, blue is good and dark or red is bad. I don't think it meant any harm. Ball lightning is statically charged, but doesn't cause any actual damage outside of some electronics lights flickering and stuff, maybe some slightly charred grass or something. <laughs> I guess I'd run away too if a giant ball of electrified light was strolling towards me, <laughs> just to be on the safe side. Maybe it's just some spirits that wanna that are lonely or something, but still, try to manifest as a human and then I'll, I'll talk to you, but not as a giant ball of electricity. <laughs> Case notes for the bonus file, the mystery of basement bangings. Yeah, so if Mr. Ben was involved in anything potentially of risk to himself, the last thing I'd be thinking of is about taking a video. As for the strange behavior of both dogs, hmm. We know animals can be possessed by spirits, but it's odd, isn't it? To hop between both dogs, then fade away never to return after years? I don't know if that quite fits, but I'm not sure what else would compel your dogs to do this, and never again in all that time. Very strange one. And now time for the quote of the day. Opera is when a guy gets stabbed in the back and, instead of bleeding, he sings. Ed Gardner. Opera is a very interesting thing, and there is some like orchestral opera style music in some movies, like or video games, like in the Halo theme song. If you don't know about that, look it up on YouTube, it's amazing. Or in the final battle in the Matrix trilogy against uh, Mr. Smith, that orchestral piece, every time I want to be hyped up for something, or if I want to lift something heavy, I just listen to that and Instant energy. It's amazing. <laughs> okay, so it's about 1278. The Fatherly Time Warp Chronicles. You don't know why it messed up your head? Even if this happened to me, a narrator who's seen hundreds or thousands of stories along these lines, I'd also get the zoom in on my face of total shock and awe. <laughs> you know, I love how you put that. Even though it could be as simple as your father's soul being ahead in time by a factor of 10 minutes, that doesn't change how mesmerizing it'd be to experience this actually happening. He was sleeping, so a soul jump event is more likely. That or the glitch was from your own mind, seeing buffered reality 10 minutes at a time. That can happen. Would need more information to know, for instance, if you heard a car starting afterwards, then it'd be foresight, as a soul jump wouldn't take the car, and the car wouldn't be there anymore. 
Case notes for the bonus file, when laundry machines go wild. See, your friend heard the noises through the phone too, which is very important. It tells me these spiritual events are not mere hallucinations or like spiritual interfacing into your mind. In other words, they truly do manifest in the physical world, enough to cause vibrations in the air, i.e. sound, that was picked up on the phone. It's a really cool detail. But the other aspect is the infrequency of the apparition. Now maybe they did appear to others within this time frame over a year, but it still surprises me. If I was a spirit, I'd try to manifest as often as I could. Maybe it's an energy limitation. These spirits do need energy to manifest and operate in the mortal realm. It's not as easy as just, well, I want to go see some, you know, my friend, so that's just appear. No, it probably does require a lot of energy. And the, the, good, the more good you are, the less you want to siphon energy away from people. A kind of spiritual energy too, maybe not just thermal. So, feeling cold isn't just the effect on outside air, but also internal. You're losing energy. Okay, so to the bonus file. When revenge and the supernatural collide. The plausibility of subconsciously finding and pocketing your action figure is real. It does happen, especially hopped up on adrenaline and anticipation of revenge. Could the spirit of Sneaky Pete have helped you out? Maybe. It seems out of character given how violent he had been, or at least the stories go as the stories go. But even spirits might be able to change, or maybe he wasn't as violent as described. Maybe that was just the story that kids say. They do tend to embellish on details to make it more interesting. And of course, you're, you change your clothes before going there, so you hadn't accidentally found it before. It wasn't just accidentally in your pocket and you didn't realize. No, you went there without it and then came back with it. Yeah, something put it there. Maybe you, maybe a ghost. I don't know. Friendly, sneaky Pete the ghost. <laughs> Fair enough. And now time for the question of the day. What makes you roll your eyes every time you hear it? A few things. For me, one of the more annoying things is when people say we only use 10% of our brains. No, we use all of it just in different parts. It's like a computer. You don't use a graphics card when you're just on the desktop or barely at all because you're not running a 3D application. But then when you load up a game, then it, it's used. The brain is compartmentalized in certain uh, areas where some parts are responsible for others. Like for me, the visual cortex is overstimulated, so I always have visual snow, this tiny grain of film I always see. So that part of my brain is overstimulated, but it's not my whole brain, just that part. Curious what you guys think. What makes your eyes roll when you hear it? Okay, so file 1279, the picture that cannot exist. I think I will assume the role of the family photographer when I eventually have a family too. Sounds good. I have no explanation to offer on this one. Guardian angels don't take random pictures of the back of your head to freak you out or make you think of your mortality. It doesn't offer any sort of information on that, in my opinion anyways. It literally sounds like a true to God error of the simulation. Like information from a parallel universe infiltrating over here. But it's not a digital signal, it's an analog Polaroid picture, and there's nothing transmitting there. So how could that happen, I really don't know. Almost like two universes occupied the exact same space for that brief flash. And you know, while your dad was stern, he truly did love you. Wanted to keep you safe, protected even against minor risks. So, just remember that about him. It's very sweet. Even if it was annoying, I suppose. Okay, so to the creepy file number 118. The Malignant Whispers. So right, picking up other voices from CB Radio, which by the way refers to Citizen's Band. I didn't even know that until I looked it up. It wouldn't even explain the words spoken, though. Or it wouldn't make them less terrifying. The last line of, no matter how hard you try, no one's coming for you. Well, that isn't just a threat. It sounds like someone being held captive by a torturous soul. And is it that, hearing words spoken in this home from decades ago? Spirits reliving a um, terrible scene? Or was it an ongoing crime at the time that somehow was caught in an active radio and transmitted to yours while yours was shut off too? That doesn't make sense, does it? Is it a kind of spiritual ripple in time? Maybe more likely? Since spirits have the juice to turn on electronics regardless of their manual setting, they can bridge the circuit. I hope whoever was trapped managed to escape, if it was happening at the time in real time or ages ago. I guess we'll never know. And now time for the quote of the day. Don't limit a child to your own learning, for he was born in another time. Rabbinical saying. Well, they do say that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And I think there is some genetic truth to that. We 
tend to emulate our parents, especially your, the one directly associated with you, like your father if you're a guy, or your mother if you're a girl. For me, it's definitely true. My dad is、uh, very introverted. He prefers just to go camping over the summers and pretty much lives alone, does his own thing on his own time. But as far as learning, I think the most important thing is to teach your kids good values, and they're not too complicated. Don't lie. Don't steal. Be honest. Don't aggress against others. And maybe honesty is the most important thing. No, the most important thing is don't be hypocritical. If you're going to do something, or if you don't want someone else to do it, you can't do it yourself because then you're being a hypocrite, and it doesn't apply. You're breaking the symmetry of、uh, ethics, and that is very dangerous. So don't be hypocritical. Would be my core lesson to impart on my kids. But as far as what a kid wants to do. What interests them? If it's something that diverges from you, you know the family trade. Well, I think that's a bit archaic. Let them grow into whatever they find interesting. That'll be their purpose, or at least enable them to find their purpose. Okay, so let's file twelve hundred and eighty. I dodge the Grim Reaper's scythe. Right, quantum immortality stories never cease to excite me. Completely resetting your experience to a universe where the same mistake that you made in the first one was avoided. The tragic fate that befell you, where you originally came from, was spared. It doesn't change the horrors those you love will face, though. They still have to grieve for a loss they believe is permanent and irreparable. And for that, I still live very cautiously myself. Even though I believe in quantum immortality to 99.99%, I don't want anyone in this universe that loves me to miss me if I'm gone. Not to mention everyone who would be stranded without these great stories. That would be unfortunate. <laughs> so I want to stay alive here to spare my friends and my parents any grief that may be caused by my passing. The wildest thing to consider is how many times it may have already happened. Though I'd never truly know. Most deaths wouldn't be epic jaunts on a motorcycle or other high octane risky activities like that. It's sad in a way to ponder that angle, though. If you've died many times from an illness or something, and you just never know. I guess it is important to think about too. To remember that it's important to not be too risky in life, because people here still care about you, and they may not know or believe in quantum immortality. And even if they do, there would still be great pain in knowing that you can never interact with them directly, even though they're off doing their own thing and they probably never even <laughs> know the difference. But you will empathy, I guess. Okay, so let's file twelve hundred eighty-one. My lost license materialized five years later. So are we convinced yet, collectively? That we have guardian angels watching out for us. It isn't just life and death shielding. Not at all. There's absolutely no freaking way that this is just a coincidence. Just thinking of this as a coincidence, like these comedic Instagram reels where a person you know is at home, about to go to work or something, when a ball bounces, lands on their face, knocking them into the bed, somehow pulling the cover over them, then bounces over to the kitchen and kicks the bag of Doritos onto their face. The perfect error. <laughs> It's not that. If that actually happened, obviously it's not some freak of physics. Nope, some will is involved here. In this case, it's more perplexing because while there's no way it's a coincidence, in what way exactly does it help you? I can't see how returning a lost license does that, but maybe your guardian angel was seeing the landscape from a higher level than we can. Okay, so let's file 1282. Tinsel, eggnog, and ghosts. Plenty of reports to tell us that spirits can manifest openly in the material world. From moving objects around to multiple people seeing these spirits, or making noise sufficient to even be heard over a phone line. But here's the thing: just because those things can happen doesn't mean that spiritual interfacing isn't a thing too. Heck, it may be easier for spirits to link up with a human mind, a human soul, than fully migrating into our plane. The latter, I'd guess, requires far more effort and energy to accomplish. These two spirits lingering behind on Christmas, wanting a connection. But energetically tapped out and not being able to complete the voyage over here. But your buddy is there, spiritual Wi-Fi ports open, ready to interface. No harm intended, or freaking out your friend out. That's not their intent, I think. Just so good old chaps wanting a bit of human living on such a holy night. It's kind of wholesome in a way, but obviously, yeah, I'd be freaked out too. <laughs> I don't feel bad about that. Okay, so it's for the bonus file. My feline angels, final cuddle. The question in my mind here is: Was it the manifested spirit from your feline friend giving you a final cuddle, 
Or was it your mind somehow able to glean information that your cat had passed and created the sensation of this cuddle session to grant itself an easing over the loss? Either could be the case. I like to think that it was your cat's spirit directly. Spirits can travel great distances instantly, and given it was fresh, I'd bet his soul had tons of energy to it in order to accomplish the last necessary voyage to comfort his favorite human. It's beautiful. And now time for the quote of the day. Far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs even though checkered by failure, than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy nor suffer much because they live in the gray twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. Theodore Roosevelt This is quite a quote indeed, and I think it can be boiled down to, it's better to try and fail than never to try at all. And those failures aren't even a negative. They do checker your life, but in a good way. Without them, you wouldn't even know to appreciate victory. A lot of people are born with a silver spoon in their mouth, and they may have some success in life, they may try, but they'll never be able to appreciate it. So yes, live a good life, have adversity, and fail. It's a good thing. Case notes for file 1283, Hole in Spacetime versus Heroic Dog. I'm so sorry for your loss, damn it. Especially in that brutal way. Anything that can harm a dog is pure evil in my book, or truly without sense. Thing is, this gives me truly eerie vibes, and makes me think about the couple of stories I read a while back about dots in spacetime. Anyone remember those? One was small, and one was larger in a person's living room, and there were two people seeing it. And they're described similarly, like light is being absorbed, almost like a hole in spacetime or a black hole. How I imagine the event horizon of a black hole would look anyways, but without the whole world ending aspect to it. It's odd though, because there haven't been a lot of stories about it in a long time, and this is an older story from a while back, so I wonder if whatever was causing these holes just went away. Anyways, I'll take dragons, angry ghosts, space time portals any day of the week over this. The emptiness described. Is it an actual entity? Maybe your dog's passing was from a different animal or unrelated to this, but I don't know. The impression I get from these is if you went inside of it, it would be true emptiness, and I think even your soul would be erased. I think it's total erasure. No quantum immortality from crossing this. Do not go in them. If you ever see one, just run away. Okay, so file 1284. Did I predict my friend's words? The feeling of déjà vu itself can be a clue to explaining this. It's possible that two minds, minds that almost belong to each other, become attuned, maybe even entwined, to the point of finishing each other's sentences and indeed thinking the same thoughts in unison. But the feeling of déjà vu tilts this. I think this was a moment you both experienced multiple times together, pulled from buffered reality. Perhaps it was a necessary learning experience, formative for your future growth together. I can picture this being discussed in the real world, where this is seen as a game, a heavy game, a simulation, but really the purpose is to learn about yourself and how you'd react in any given situation. But even more, reacting over time to different scenarios. And I think to ingrain specific events, repetition is required. Even if you don't always consciously remember each scenario, think about it. What's the best way to retain information? Write it down again and again, reinforce the mental pathways. If our brains in the real world function at all like ours in the simulation, then it makes total sense why you'd repeat the same scenes. Okay, so it's about 1285. Spacetime as a pretzel. To taunt spirits is never a good idea. <laughs> Even if it doesn't lead directly to death, why mess with an ethereal world that cannot be defended against? Even to be messed with intermittently could easily drive the sanest of minds totally mad. Creating an illusion of heart beating inside of a purse is pure horror. That's not a friendly spirit, let's say. You know, even if I was a ghost and being taunted, I wouldn't go that far. That's a bit creepy. <laughs> as far as the duplicate sister walking by twice or multiple times, space-time portals would be my guess, but it's not that hard to visualize. Ever seen a black hole? How it curves light around itself so you literally can see behind the black hole? Its own accretion disk, not to mention the stars and so on? It's trippy, but if you understand that time itself is part of space-time, it'd be a similar effect but instead for time. So instead of light being bent, it was time itself, within this localized area near the family office. What was going to happen 
was warped to happen earlier multiple times per you and your dad's reference frames. To your sister, nothing was different. When you're inside of it, everything appears normal. Same thing as the Lorentz transformation for um, high velocity or near gravity, high gravity wells. You yourself wouldn't notice anything different, but time outside would pass at a different rate and uh, would pass much, much faster relative to time inside the high velocity area. Per your reference frame, everything would look normal though, which is not intuitive at all. And now time for the question of the day. What is something you're terrible at, but wish you could do well? For me, it would be singing and dancing. Yeah, I have a good voice for narration, but I can't sing. I don't have the pitch for it, I guess, but uh, yeah, it would be cool, you know. It's weird. I guess I'm a drawn to something that is so opposite of my personality, being the singer and dancer that goes on stage in front of 100,000 people and just sings. There's a certain appeal to that, mainly because it's so foreign to me. That's not in my cards. What about you? What would you love to be able to do that just isn't in your cards? Okay, so it's file 1286. A physicist's perspective on quantum immortality. So I'm glad you feel this way now, knowing so many other people experience a similar, though not as extreme, version of quantum immortality. And it's true, they do. Thousands, millions of people. I mean, we probably all do at some point in our lives. So really billions. Also, I'm just so incredibly sorry about your parents going through an incurable illness and you having to help them out in that. It's just terrible. Even if quantum immortality is true, it doesn't change the fact that as the survivors, we don't get to jump universes with our loved ones. We're faced with the everlasting lingering here. Honestly, I don't have words for how sorry I am. So many bad things happen to you in such a small period of time. <sighs> it's just truly wrong. The bottle of pills is curious. If you had already completed the transition to a new universe, taking 60 pills wouldn't be survivable in any universe where human physiology matches your original universe. Unless we're like superhuman over there. Maybe in the new one, you simply took a smaller dose and flushed the rest in the toilet or something. Would explain why you felt terrible, but you still survived. You were going to go through with it, but you didn't fully commit. And both families not sharing your memory of the first meeting with your partner is very strong evidence of quantum immortality indeed. Sorry that it didn't end up working out. It does make you wonder if soulmates can change depending on the universe you occupy. If the differences in personality are pronounced enough, then I think so. And that isn't to say that soulmates have to be a total match and like, you have to like the same things and think the same way. No, yin and yang. Sometimes we're attracted to the opposite. But if personality does change, it can mean that maybe she was more like you than you wanted. As for constant shifting, I think this could happen if your soul is jumping more than once. It's important to realize that in most accounts, there aren't many differences at all between universes. I like to think of the multiverse as being organized by differences. The more similar two universes are to each other, the greater their proximity. Just speculation, but my guess is, in a soul jump event, you move to the nearest universe where a copy of you that is still alive exists. Sometimes this would be far away, in which case you'd notice more differences. Also, it's pretty cool that you run your own dojo on top of everything. How do you have the time for all that? <laughs> Amazing. And now time for the quote of the day. A sense of humor is part of the art of leadership, of getting along with people, of getting things done. Dwight D. Eisenhower it's not just a military commander, but in any job. Like if you're a manager for uh, even just a fast food chain, you know, Taco Bell or McDonald's or whatever. If the type of managerial skill you have is just being a dictator, in the people that remain, maybe they'll be more efficient, but probably not long term. But you'll get high turnover. You don't want that. You want to be in the muck with people, willing to do the same jobs they are, even as a manager. Humor can alleviate a lot of friction that can uh, accumulate over time, especially with uh, customer service oriented jobs. So yeah, you want to be there in the muck with your soldiers, so to say. Crack jokes here and there. Don't be too serious. It's a tough balance, but you want to be serious enough to get the job done, but also joyful enough and lighthearted enough that not necessarily be friends with those under you, but also just treat them like humans. And having jokes is a great way to accomplish that. Or at least laughing at their joke. Case notes file 1287. The Hitchhiker from Hell. 
So I thought the title, The Hitchhiker from Hell, seems so apt for the story because it sounds like a depiction of the devil. Not a horned demon in the religious mythos, the devil wasn't malformed. He is an angel, probably good looking, and his entire being is about testing humans, corrupting them through free will they have to make their own choices, not rampaging around causing chaos directly himself. But I imagine he would get off as being a sadist and tormenting people and scaring them to hell. <laughs> Still, the desire here from whatever this entity was, was to cause you extreme terror in your soul. It lingered for days, maybe weeks. You could hear his laughter in your nightmares, I mean that's terrifying. <laughs> maybe we're dealing with a skinwalker or something along those lines, but the perfect mimicry of a large but polite man? I don't know. It sends chills down my spine just reading the story as a third party. Okay, so it's for the bonus file. Walking in darkness and in love. A heavy story this is, but a very positive ending it had. As most on the channel know, I'm agnostic, which means I don't proclaim knowledge in terms of religion or spirituality, the meta layer of reality, you know, beyond the universe. I try to understand the universe, where we're stuck in right now, how it works, the anomalies that people report, but the deeper truth behind it all, simulation, God, whatever it may be, even though I have a personal preference of the simulation, I don't know, maybe there is just a God and it's similar to the Christian ethos or Muslim or Buddhist, I don't know. <laughs> if God does exist, it sounds like he wanted you to know he doesn't hate you at all. In a way, simulation or not, the purpose of our existence here would be the same, I imagine, to test ourselves, to learn who we are. And after all, you can't know how tough something is until it takes a few licks. But that doesn't mean we're alone. Hell no. Even if it's just a simulation, maybe it was your friend that was just trying to comfort you. Because I mean, I imagine they could watch us play. From uh, observer mode, I guess. Maybe that those are our guardian angels, our friends in the real world. Oh, that's an interesting, <laughs> interesting idea. Suffice to say, if you're a good person, you're worthy of love and respect. It doesn't matter how smart you are or skilled or what you do for work, it doesn't matter at all. It's really just about your moral character. That's it. Now time for the quote of the day. There will be a time when loud-mouthed, incompetent people seem to be getting the best of you. When that happens, you have only to be patient and wait for them to self-destruct. It never fails. Richard Reibold if someone is rude and inconsiderate, they're probably not the smartest of people, and they'll probably make mistakes, and their own lives will self-sabotage just by their idiocy or their uh, malfeasance. If someone is bothering you, generally speaking, it's best to ignore them. Don't give them more energy. That They want to siphon. It's like the vampire mythos where they want to steal energy from you. It's not directly through like biting you and taking your blood life force. No, it's taking your mental and spiritual energy. So don't give it to them. Give them nothing. Move on. Case notes file 1288. My impossible odyssey. Surviving three days in 114 Fahrenheit heat. The part where you describe collapsing and then waking up again with renewed vigor reminds me of the scene in Lord of the Rings. Frodo is completely drained and crashes down just after fighting uh, Shelob. Only to be in a gentle forest clearing with Lady Galadriel there to infuse hope into him again purpose. Now, she probably wasn't really there, it's just in his mind, but it's the same, basically the same thing that happened to you, in real life. Now, maybe this was a guardian angel, and if it was, maybe your guardian angel wasn't as powerful as Galadriel, but still, they have your back. What a truly incredible adventure that was. And I've had some rather crazy roaming journeys myself, but nothing even come close to this. Curious though, if it was a, a pasture grazing with a cattle, I guess it would be hard to find like the farmhouse. I don't know how big of an area that is and you were out of it. So you just got water to survive and then the helicopter found you. Damn, that's incredible. Creepy file number 119. My unexplained naked midnight run. So the second time you woke up after coming back from the naked escapade through the hotel, you had on a different shirt? It does sound like you sleepwalk a lot, but does that explain it all? Did you sleepwalk down through the fire escape into someone else's room in an empty bed? Maybe it was an unoccupied room? Something about that doesn't connect though. I mean, there would be a lock on the window, no? From the outside? So even if it was vacant, you shouldn't have been able to get in. I mean, you're not lockpicking the window while sleepwalking. <laughs> Naked too. But it's a weird confluence of events, isn't it? On a side note, I'm glad that I've never been a sleepwalker. That'd be terrifying in its own right. 
going to bed, never knowing where you'd end up, maybe in the middle of the road on the edge of a cliff. Just crazy. I guess it's a, still a reflection of your own actions, your subconscious taking over. I don't know what I'd do. I guess a lot of pranks. I'd wake up and the whole house is booby-trapped with pranks. Okay, so it's for the bonus file. From balloons to military nightmares. Given that the tree was replaced by this ghost, I'd say it was a spiritual interfacing event, where the spirit taps directly into your brain to make you conjure up certain images of him. Perhaps you saw your brother as a dog because a soldier had a pet at the time? Maybe not for battle, just as a life companion. His way to pop in, say hello, show you his dog. I think these events can be amplified by our mindsets too. Our mental and spiritual energies attune given proximity with each other and sharing similar thoughts, as would happen on a holy holiday like Christmas. Maybe a lot of people were thinking about the battle too. But I think this would call uh, for positive spirits, not negative ones. I never get the impression of malice from these events where ghosts are appearing to people at a family gathering or in your sleep. It's very rare that it's malicious. And now time for the quote of the day. Never let the demands of tomorrow interfere with the pleasures and excitement of today. Meredith Wilson So there is something to be said with this, not taken to an extreme, because if you only live for today, then tomorrow will probably be rather unpleasant. But if you only live for tomorrow, then what's the point in never living? You're always living for the next day and never enjoying life. So there's, a, again, always a balance, right? You want to take pleasure in the things of today, and I try to just take pleasure in the simple thing. Going on a walk, a beautiful sunrise, Mr. Ben tugging me along, great food. What more can you need? I need pie, is what I need. Blueberry pie. Yes. Like the video for blueberry pie. And all that other good stuff. Okay, so it's file 1289. A total stranger knew my password. Sure, there are proficient hackers out there who can parse out private information using exploits in software and operating systems. Now, is a random lad in middle school on a bus one of them? I'm going to go with nope. Is it a coincidence? No way. Of course, the reason they said these numbers at all is overhearing your conversation, but to guess it the first try when the password was just changed the night before, it can't be a guess. In these weird moments where it can't be a coincidence, but there's no real reason for any being to intervene, provide this information, honestly I have no clue what caused it. Somehow that young mind just knew the information, it was harpooned in. It's very strange. Okay, so for the bonus file. A paranormal pregnancy. Blind, jug-eared, cotton stuff moron. <laughs> Why does this insult flow so fluid? Shakespeare wrote it himself. I will be stealing this line. What did she say to him, I do wonder, though? Perhaps her own faith in God was what she believed saved her, and she imparted that into Ron, working through all of you, I guess. And then, how would this affect Ron, with sliced flesh appearing on himself with no source? This is one of the creepier spiritual accounts I've heard. Even expert demonologists aren't afraid of spirits and demons, usually. The amount of harm they can do to us is supposedly very little. And, I mean, this applies in all stories I've read. It's very rare for a spirit to be able to harm someone like this. But as with everything in life, there are always exceptions, aren't there? Whatever or whoever that pregnant lady was afraid of was very powerful and sadistic. Mixed with the potency of love, maybe it was a father of the pregnant woman. Maybe he died somehow, maybe by her hand as he was hurting her. Maybe that kind of emotion is as powerful as it gets. The familial betrayal, love, furious hatred, all mixed together, is enough to actually push through and harm people. You need some sort of very powerful emotion to accomplish that, I think. And now time for the quote of the day. Anarchism is founded on the observation that since few men are wise enough to rule themselves, even fewer are wise enough to rule over others. Edward Abbey. Well, yeah, anarchy isn't the colloquial use of it, where anarchy is just synonymous with chaos. What it really means is no rulers over you. It's hard to broach into that mindset where everyone seems to have a ruler right now. We can't live in a country like, maybe if we go to Mars or another planet? I know I just want to be free. And it's hard to live in a world where most people don't, really, deep down, by their choices. But anarchy is not chaos. I guess that's the first step to change the paradigm of how people view it. Okay, so let's file 1290. My father Tracy, the Lord of Rain. Every now and then, you get stories like this, so packed with emotion, 
that it's hard not to tear up when reading them. I'm so sorry for your loss, Rainbow, even though it's been a decade. There's so much beauty in this, though, isn't there? And knowledge to be gleaned. There's an afterlife of sorts. We aren't privy to the precise details, only to serve as evidence that whatever animates our bodies transcends the physical universe. He was appearing to you as this red purity and shadow, and of course with his cologne and everything. And I do contemplate this mixed with quantum immortality. There may be a moment after our death in one universe where we're presented with a choice, continue the game in another us, or reset entirely. Maybe go into a kind of observer mode with limited interaction potential, in your case more than enough to prove the existence beyond this mortal plane. Your father truly is the master of rain. And now time for the quote of the day. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. Alan Kay. Reminds me of the Apple CEO from the past, um, Steve Jobs. His mindset was to create a new product that people didn't even know they wanted until they had it. In that sense, it's a way to predict the future by simply building it yourself. Obviously hard to do, but it is a way to do it, or now more modern times with Elon Musk, where, well yeah, he's a controversial figure, but you can't deny that he's accomplishing pretty amazing things. And especially if he actually manages to go to Mars with, with real human astronauts, that would be out of this world, quite literally. I hope he is able to predict the future by building it. I really want my own spaceship at some point. By the way, if you haven't seen it, watch The Expanse. It's a fantastic TV show series uh, based on book, uh, book series, and the books I haven't read, but I hear they're great. But the show is fantastic. The sets, the actors, they have great chemistry together, and the science is extremely accurate for a TV show. You don't usually see that. Where you have a ship that can spin on its own axis while in space and moving very fast, and then to alter your vector, you have to burn burn, as they call it. You have to activate your ship's drive and actually eject mass in the direction counter to where you want to go. Push it, go the other way. Newton is all up in that. <laughs> and also gravity, you have spin gravity and also just acceleration from the ship itself. There's no like gravity plating or anything like that, like you get in most uh, TV shows. Plenty of other details, but I just love hard science in TV shows because it gives you a glimpse of what really could be. Almost every, there's, I don't want to spoil anything, there's some things in the show that probably aren't realistic, but almost everything you see could happen. And you know, a couple centuries from now, we might actually be out there on Mars and the moon and in the asteroid belt, mining the asteroid belt. I think it'll happen. Maybe even sooner than that. Okay, so on so file, 1291. The $1.99 burrito that defied the laws of physics. Ah, I see. What you're dealing with here is the Chris Angel of burrito tricks. Sleight of hand. Fooled ya. But no, seriously, if this was a test, and it legitimately may have been, I don't think it's irreconcilable even though you failed it. I think most would, after so many chained, frustrating events leading you in circles like a ferris wheel, and then it's kind of a minor bad thing to do, you know, $10 of thievery, sort of. If it was a test, my gut is telling me that your guardian angel, well, whoever is looking out for you, wants to get to know you better. I don't think our guardian angels are so all-knowing. They need to understand who we are, what can push our buttons, so as to be best served in protecting us. Bodyguards in these days too, they get to know the person they're protecting. You have to learn their patterns, what they like, what their uh, weaknesses are, and so on. I am very keen on the notions of guardian angels these days, but this could also be a classic case of DOP, burrito style. The lady at the counter made a mistake in scanning just the burrito code. That wasn't a glitch, you just got lucky in paying a little for a full meal. At the same time, that burrito did exist then, but between then and you opening the meal to dig in, it just vanished. So it appeared probably in a different place on the planet or in a different universe. In one of those, you're driving along and you have two burritos. <laughs> Twice the fried goodness. Yeah, shame you weren't in that universe. The me in another universe where the burrito went over there, I would be reading the same glitch, but instead of having no burrito, me in another universe is just reading basically the same glitch by the same person, but it's just an extra burrito instead of not. Case notes, file 1292. The perfect row of dominoes that saved our lives. I can say there are times when protection is given to us in subtle ways, almost as a whisper, meant to be known and yet not seen exactly, such as in this case. So many little dominoes had to fall in order for you to meet that exact person at the exact time, to offer him cigarettes as you say, 
and for him to not exactly be a good person if he's part of this group that wanted to harm two girls. And yet, because you knew him, he felt a weird connection, enough to get the group to spare both of you? How does this happen, Riddy? Are we dealing with random chance? It's possible. Is there some higher being, an angel, your guardian angel, or developer, trying to guide this meeting months ago? With their kind of crystal ball that can see possible future events, noticing one that kept occurring to you and trying to prevent it from happening in the, this universe. Not every low chance event will be from some external being. Important to keep that in mind. Coincidences really do happen, but sometimes they're just so astounding it's hard to believe they're coincidences. I choose to believe that there's more going on in this case. And now time for the quote of the day. Anybody can sympathize with the sufferings of a friend, but it requires a very fine nature to sympathize with a friend's success. Oscar Wilde. There is something in us where if we see a friend, or really anyone, but especially someone we know, do well, progress in their life, it almost feels like they're leaving us behind. Of course, that's not what they're doing. The, the idea isn't to leave you behind. If they're a good friend, then you're still tethered. And maybe the tether is uh, has some give, so it can stretch. But no matter what, you're still pulled along. So it goes both ways. You know, if, if your friend suddenly becomes extremely successful and doesn't share anything with you, if you're destitute, you know, and <laughs> a good friend isn't going to let you starve or anything like that, um, it doesn't mean they owe you their their bounty and their wealth, but I'm just saying that the, the cord does stretch, but it does pull you along a bit too. If you're feeling jealous about their success, I think it ultimately speaks about your own perception of your value and your... Um, you don't believe that you can succeed then. Because if someone else succeeds, it doesn't really, it doesn't mean that you won't succeed. Lower self-worth and just no hope that you're going to be able to succeed yourself. Look internally if that's how you feel when someone else succeeds and just think, okay, am I going to be able to succeed, to succeed in what I'm doing? And if not, maybe try something else. The anger you're feeling or the, the frustration is not about them. It's about you. Like the video, subscribe, hit the bell. Kinetic Symphony signing off.